And we are live. Folks, hello and welcome to Talking Crit. So, uh, I am uh, Eric Shankar, your bartender in the OSR. Uh, my work spouse, see, I, I can figure this out now. My work spouse is mm -hmm. right there, uh, screen right, uh, at least once mm -hmm. a week. Yep, yep, yep. Because uh, I've seen things from like that nobody should have to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, and below us is uh, Griffith Morgan, uh, frequently referred to as, I guess, Griff. Uh, yeah, Griff is where it works. Um, that really bad uh, Grognard guy that works too. Um, uh, uh, and uh, he's probably best known, or maybe you don't even realize this, for the Secrets of Blackmore documentary, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, I watched. I was a backer. I watched, and then like a week ago, I went, I really need to watch this again because it's just that good. And it's, and it's, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, something else that came out because of the documentary, which is, of course, going to be hidden by my screen. But, but Griff has a nicer looking copy. There we go. And, uh, there that go. Oh, and and other uh, mm. oh and oh my god we have Ty Beard in the audience all right maybe we better oh, we, we got a lawyer watching us right now so we got to watch out what we say um, but in any case folks welcome to Talking Crit um, I'm gonna spend a moment catching up on the Chatterers uh, thank you Shadows thank you uh, Z Wiki for or Z these Wiki how was my Z Change your name to something that I can actually. It's always pronounce. been easy, Wiki. I know, but I want to pronounce it Z Wiki. But right. I'm a New Yorker. Fuck it. Um, oh, by the way, Griff, just so you know, we, we don't worry about monetization, even though we're monetized. This oh, yeah, I can talk about my monetization stuff. Yeah, whatever. Well, you, well, you know, it's the movie. It. I just, yeah, when it when it comes time, I'll just tell people to go to. Uh, well, it's we have it in two places right now. Uh, you can see it on Amazon Prime, and you can see it in. Uh, um, on Vimeo, the thing about Amazon Prime is they take half of what you pay. Mm. And so, whereas Vimeo, because we, we pay for the service, we have an account that we pay an annual fee on, um, we get most of the profit directly to us. So I always try to direct people to Vimeo. People complain because it's like another service to sign up for. Um, I mean, either way, you know, but the more the merrier. And really, the, my big complaint is just uh, when we started working on the movie, people we were talking to said, "Oh my God, when you make this movie, the gamers, you're gonna you're gonna be a millionaire, right? Gamers are gonna go crazy over it." And I said, "No, you don't understand what independent film is like. You know, someone will watch it and they'll be happy, and then that'll be that." And so my big thing is just uh, if you've seen it or uh, if you know other gamers, you know, let them know that we're out there and we've done this thing. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got it in my queue on uh, Amazon. It was I think it, uh, I pulled up it was four dollars to rent. Mm -hmm. Buy was ten, buy was ten dollars. I have thirty days to watch it, so I've I've got it. I just need to watch it before the end of the month. <laughs> I still have not seen it, but it's on my it's in my queue. Okay. Yeah. Month, so you know, if you like uh, the sort of PBS style documentary, I think you'll really like it. If you like the sort of blingy like History Channel type stuff, you know, oh, yeah, where no, it, it's, it's kind of it's it's really well done, and that's. Something that uh, actually I, I like the remark on because I've I've watched all right pretty much every gaming documentary right. that you can find of what's it, Eye of the Beholder and other stuff like that and and some is more uh, flash and some is more like the actual proper dare, dare I say it, like storytelling like mm -hmm. when you mm -hmm. watch Secrets of Blackmore you. Or get, you're not just getting snippets. You're not just getting, hey, here's this little piece here, and we're going to move on to some other random piece. It builds a story. It builds the background. You see it progress. And um, I don't see every other gaming documentary do that. A lot of them are obsessed with, hey, we got uh, this old school gamer. This old, this right. old partner. We got this old, this old TSR employee. And look, we got to have them on the screen. But they're shoved in because uh, of name recognition. Right, they, you go and you think you're going to get a lot more, and then you just, it's like, oh, yeah, I got to see so-and-so, but I didn't right. really get the full story. Right, well, you know, um, and, and it's interesting, but with 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 Blackmore, you, you watch it, and you feel like you're progressing through it. Everything builds upon it. Every piece, 
nothing seems like oh well we 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 had a, we had to change the topic so just shove this piece in for the transition nothing nothing is like that now I know we've spoke, yeah. we spoke a bit uh, over the past couple of months about this. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There are, my understanding is, hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of. of yeah, we we. Yeah. I mean, we spent years before we even did the Kickstarter. I think we'd been working for two and a half years by then, or maybe longer. It took us six and a half years to do the movie, wow. um, uh, and so we interviewed everybody we could there were a lot of people that were uh didn't want to be interviewed at first now they want to be interviewed they've seen the movie and they're like oh wow this is really good you know like i thought you were going to do some fly-by-night thing like you were describing for youtube that's right. just garbage i don't want to be involved in that or i thought you were going to want to want me to talk about the dave gary thing which we don't really talk about well you don't know, actually you, you handle that with a lot of respect which i think well, i think it's some people yeah, I think I, one thing I always tell people is that I feel that uh, they don't understand the Gary Arneson relationship. And um, the Gygax, I think Gygax got a little bit, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to infer what Gary did, but when they were working on D&D, &D, they were working closely together at a distance. They were on the phone, they were writing each other letters. Um, we have the typewriter that Gail Gygax used to type the entire manuscript for Dave Arneson. As Dave Arneson said, you know, I didn't type a word of Dungeons and Dragons. And he was being facetious. When they went to trial, he showed up with get with all these manuscripts because Gail was like a pro and she had made carbon copies of every draft. So he's got, you know, a pile of paper like this of D and D drafts and and that he can show at the court and be like, Well, yeah, this is what I sent back, you know. Um <clears throat> and then um and I don't want to go into all of that, but um um, you know, so it's, it was very evident that he had done a lot. Um, if you look at it, there are things in there that, uh, you can find papers that have rules on them that are Arneson rules for all kinds of things that are, he, he does this thing where he reuses rules and he reuses them in, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, like the magic sword rules. I bet Gary edited those and maybe added his own twist but there are things in there. I, I forgot what the stat is, but there's one, there's like an additional stat. It's like an additional character stat in there for the magic swords. And um, um, that comes from Arneson and, and uh, like ego or something like that. Yeah. I think it was ego. Was it ego? And uh, um, ego is what they have intelligence and ego and yeah. And it's something that comes from an earlier character sheet before Gary has even seen Blackmore, you know? Um, and so, uh, and then after the fact, I've, I've repeated this story before, but when Gary is kind of wanting to produce more product, he goes, he literally goes to Dave Arneson's house out near San Francisco and has dinner with, with Dave and his daughter and his wife at Dave's house. And he's like, you know, you should come back and do these modules. So Arneson does the DA modules, which there were supposed to be five. And um, um, only four were released. And then TSR went through it all of its shenanigans and collapsed. Um, but it's like, well, if Dave and Gary hate each other that much, how come we're not even 10 years out from their debacle or very, very, maybe nine, eight, nine years from, from their supposed schism where they're going to be enemies and do like, you know, WWF wrestling for the rest of their lives. Um, and they've just decided to like, okay, I'll come back and I'll do some modules for, for uh, TSR and that'll be great. You know, uh, and so you can, I mean, you can infer whatever you want, you know, from that. But after that, they would send each other cards. They were far apart. They were both in the industry, but it was like, yeah, we're the two guys that did it. Okay. We created this entire industry that seems to be wanting to ignore us. We, you know, look at D and D now, they're not, their names aren't even on the cover, you know, and it's just uh, a reverse engineered copy of the original D and D's, you know, first edition and AD and D. So, um, essentially, um, and, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, you can make what you want of that. I kind of try to look at it as like, we need to step back and just look at what happened and, and have a more, uh, sort of historical perspective on this and realize that without the, uh, the synergy of both of these great brains coming together, you know, you wouldn't have gotten this amazing game. Um, so yeah, that's my big spiel on that.
you know, I'm just tired of all the fighting. You know, Gary did this, Dave did that. So I can, well, you know, speaking, well, uh, speaking of fi fighting, so uh, it's interesting that you, I mean, it's really cool you finished this project because there was two competing documentaries that had a big giant lawsuit battle for years and years and unfortunately you know, we never got to see either, either of them so it's great that you actually came out with the doc i mean yours you could actually watch it you could actually yeah. came out and saw it so so it's, well you gotta be you know you gotta be on a team um i think that people i don't know i mean i watched those guys implode um i got my fingers crossed that they're going to do a decent job with the gary gygax documentary that's being made i think they're going to show drafts at gary Khan. um you know, I don't have a problem with them making a movie because if people go see that movie on Vimeo or, or if they go see it on, on uh, Amazon, you know, our movie is going to be next in the queue. Sure. For them, oh, yeah. Right. And if people oh, God, see yeah. our movie and see theirs, yeah. theirs is going to be next in the queue. I, I, um, what uh, was the secret, Secrets of uh, it was the, great, the, was the, great, the great Kingdom? Based. Yeah, Great Kingdom. I can't remember the other one was called. Yeah, yeah. first it was, it was, well, there have been a lot. Uh, originally, Dave Arneson tried to do a documentary. And it was supposed really? to be called Dragons in the Basement. And I have a hard that, drive uh -huh. with yep. all the footage on it. Um, I talked to John. We were never able to really work out an arrangement with John. And then later he was like, well, I thought you guys were working with me. And it was like he had been ill for a while. And so I think that things kind of fell by the wayside during that time. And it was like, uh, we never heard from you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> I think things got lost when he got he was hospitalized for something or something like that. I'm not going to say his thing. But um um, so yeah, there's all this, this footage for dragons in the basement. Um, but it wasn't really focused on a story. I, I don't think that it was more just somebody going out and hunting and pecking. Whereas once I started to get an idea of what the story was and what the subject matter was, I became really focused on, we're going to ask questions about these specific things. And the main thing we're going to talk about is the role playing instead of rules and stuff like that. Cause that's the, the big mistake people make. Is they think the rules are the game and the role playing is the game. Um, and then, in fact, people still make this huge mistake now where they think play acting is role playing. And it's like, no, 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 no. Everything you do when you're playing the game is role playing. I walk down the passage, I listen at the door. I, anything, you know, when your dungeon master describes there's, you know, you're walking down the passage and there's cobwebs hanging in there. They're just gently blowing like there might be a little breeze in here and you're going to have to part them somehow. You know, I take my 10 foot pole and use my 10 foot pole to part them because I don't want to touch any creepy crawlies. All of that is role playing, you know, and, and, and it seems like these days people think the play acting is the role playing. And frankly, you don't have to know how to do a voice. You don't have to be an actor to be a good role playing game player, you know, and that's 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 kind of what pisses me off is is. I, I just, I kind of hate the overacting. I hate the fake English accents. The fake, <laughs> the, the ye, ye old English, I think is what we can call it. Uh, the D&D &D ye old English. Um, uh, I'm happy you just use your normal voice. When you read Lord of the Rings, what is the what is the prose in the Lord of the Rings? It's normal language, right? Right. Because that's what we understand. Um, you could name your characters Bob and, and Ralph, but by what they do, you'd realize, well, Ralph is, you know, he's a real badass fighter and Bob's like a wizard or something, you know, um, you don't always even need really uh, extravagant names or anything like that. You want to interrupt me here or I'll just keep blabbing. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> the only well, person I, I try to interrupt is Mike. That's besides. Okay. I, no, I, I just, I just want to give you kudos because um, for those who are listening or watching, don't know there, there were two attempts to, well, there was one attempt to make a documentary on, that kick started and that became two attempts because some of the people that were making that documentary broke off to make their own it all ended up in yeah. court and it was dungeons and dragons the documentary that was Savine that was it yeah and, yeah. and uh then two the, other guys i think uh yeah. i forgot their names and then they were and then they split off because they weren't happy with what the direction right. Savini was taking the movie but then they had right. agreements that made it so it's by splitting off they were uh, in competition with the product, it, and so they—it was a giant they, mess. It, it was a huge mess, and yeah, I yeah, talked to Savini all yeah. that time, and you know that's another situation where people were like, "Oh, this guy's the bad guy, that guy's the bad guy." Yeah, and people get in these situations where they feel they have like a rightful, they, you know, this righteous indignation about I'm I'm the one that's right and they're wrong, and usually it's 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 not always 
that cut and dry. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this, you know, like uh, the, 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 the art documentary that you were mentioning. Um, oh, God, yeah. Oh, oh, now, now I forget what it was called, but I mentioned it before. Yeah. Uh, oh, it slips my mind. Anyway, I mean, that was good, but it wasn't really Dungeons and Dragons, you know? No. Um, it wasn't really about the game itself. Um, so, yeah, so now we've got, I think, Pat's movie. Pat Kilbane is supposed to come out with a movie in the next year or so. Oh, really? An hours. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's funny. I go on YouTube and I see stuff. Somebody will make a and d history documentary out of stuff. And usually I'll find, like, images that they stole from our movie or our website. <laughs> and they won't yeah. fight us. Uh. Okay. Yeah, there's one that's up there, and and it's just pathetic because they've got like you know three hundred thousand views because it's free and it's not right. monetized, so you don't, you know, or maybe you get a commercial before it or after it. Um, but they reused our stuff, so the minute I see that, I'm like, well, I actually had to pay a lot of money to access those artifacts, and I'm going to do a pull down on you. <laughs> and there's one of them up there where they're, you know, we had to take this off because some jerk that you know. That actually we has... were stealing images from. But uh, see, made now, us take know, it down. Now there is this I I idea, and I believe me, I've been hearing it since uh, I was a wee podcaster. Uh, who knows? Maybe like close to ten years ago. Is that well? Uh, fair use allows you to play a certain amount of something so long as it's very specific. It's now. Very specific, and the thing is. Um, although there's, you can do more with the visuals, which is why you see a lot of these uh, YouTube videos that are covering movies and stuff that show you the video, but no sound, right? right. But you also have to interact with it. I mean, uh, if, you, if you aren't making it something substantially different than its original, then mm -hmm. you literally aren't using it for fair use. You are cop. You you are basically you're stealing. Taking, you're stealing. stealing. You're, you're taking jerk. copyrighted material, you're, yeah. and you're not transforming it. You know, yeah. You know. Well, like, you know, even within the documentary, we were very uh, specific about um, when we show something on screen, we have to be talking about it contextually. You know, we can't just like you'll see a lot of stuff where they just throw up images to kind of fill space, and they yep. do a little dance of images, but the images may not have anything to do with what the narrator or the interviewee is saying. And when you do that, that's when you risk going down the, you know, the road to getting uh, attacked <laughs> by getting someone a, like me, uh, you know. Is it a um, takedown notice or whatever it is? I... Yeah. Or, well, you know, uh, like yeah. uh, the oh, Arneson okay. estate, you know, they, we, we really worked closely with them to make sure that we weren't doing anything that would violate any of their rights and, and just being really respectful to them, you know. Um, um, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that maybe they didn't own it, but because they're on board in the credits and they like they say, you know, we approve this product by being in the credits, mm -hmm. um, that that kind of gives us a, it's got kind of like a you know protection from evil plus thirty five. It's like anything that Dave Arneson <laughs> produced that we used in the film, even if you own, you know if you own the physical copy, I don't care. The estate owns the literally owns the IP to that copy that you Right. Have, okay. You know? And so that was another reason why we did that. Um, and they were awesome, you know. Um, I don't know. It's been, it was an interesting thing working on the documentary and getting, getting to know everybody and, and uh, sort of like, uh, I mean, they, you know, they're, it's like they, they were like, yeah, you're one of us now, you know, like you're a Blackmore. You're like part of the Blackmore bunch now, both Chris and I, you've done, so much for us that you're like you're in you know and um <clears throat> it takes a long time to dis develop those kind of relationships you know oh certainly and it shows in in the documentary when you're talking with people from Dave's original gaming group you a as a viewer okay so here i am i'm i'm a third party watching this i'm not i don't know these people from a hole in the wall they don't know me mm -hmm. yet they were sharing stories that you can tell that not that oh, they're just invested in the story, but they don't necessarily feel like, oh, I'm telling this stranger a story. I'm telling right. this story to a friend. It's almost like the conversation you're going to have, dare I say it, um, at your local pub. 
because yeah, yeah, it's that kind of familiarity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even well, if for some of the guys, that's familiar, really fitting, you know. You know, yeah. And I think that's like, that. Would, that's one of the great things about uh, Secrets of Blackmore that I don't necessarily see with a lot of other documentaries and, and gaming or otherwise. I'm a, I'm a fan of documentaries. I saw a documentary about uh, pandemics uh, uh -huh. literally, literally like a month before the pandemic hit <laughs> in early 2020. And I thought it was like, wow, man, this is this is well done. But at the same time, I felt that we were being lectured to. And right. It's, That's it's, the other problem, too, is yeah. that style where yeah. it's 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 very um, uh, the, the expository style. Is, right. Is, it's like, yeah. And like, yeah, they, all right, so they weren't reading from a script, but you knew that they had to go through this. And I got to hit all these points, which yeah. um, when you watch The Secret of Blackmore, and folks, if you have not seen it, uh, I, I don't endorse many things. I don't review many things, even like cover new releases. I'm telling you, you know, what my connections are to, to the release and the people behind it. And I, I my, my reviews are few and far between because I don't think I'm qualified to do so for the most part. But I'm going to say Secrets of Blackmore was a documentary that... Um, I actually, my only regret is I didn't watch it with my wife because I ended up watching it when she was out like shopping because oh. um, it's something that even somebody who is peripheral to gaming, she games at conventions. Mike, you've seen her. She gets into it. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't game otherwise. She right. knows about the events and the hobbies <laughs> and kind of latch on to stuff because of me. But she would have enjoyed it because it's a good documentary, not just because it's about gaming. You know, it was interesting. Good. We did a... a you know, some tests, like kind of test screenings. I mean, when it's not like we were going to redo the movie, but we wanted to see what the uh, audience was, how their response was. And we did a, a test screening in a local bar, a uh, local distillery, uh, Denver distillery. Nice. And maybe, you know, nobody, I mean, it's hilarious. Once again, like once you make this movie, you're going to be a millionaire, you're going to be famous, right? We do the test screening. It's like free screening in a bar and like 12 people show up. And, um, <laughs> but there was like a woman oh, at the yeah. bar with her boyfriend and they just were there. They weren't there for our movie. And I was watching her and after a while, she's like watching the screen and watching, and she's watching it. And I think part of it was because we had so many women in the movie. Um, yep. um, and, and then, you know, the women talking about their perspective on what happened and, and their experiences, you know, and I think that was one of the things that, that made it more uh, accessible maybe for women gamers or even non gamers. It's like, mm -hmm. wait a minute there are women doing this, you know, I gotta, I gotta find out about this, you know? Um, like I just recently saw a little documentary about a woman boxer and I, and I was like, Oh, this is interesting. You know, I think she might've written a book about it. And I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, women beating the hell out of each other instead of men. <laughs> um, but it does add another layer, you know, it's like, okay, why would a woman want to do this? You know, what's well, always a good documentary. I've found is always one that makes even if you don't know anything about the subject, you get interested. Every once in a while, I, I mean, the last one I remember watching, I just I didn't really I really had a peripheral view of was that was the guy that uh, was looking for the buried uh, Atari games in the desert. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the the buried ET games, and I I don't really know. I mean, you know, yeah, whatever. And I started watching it, but it was enough the the subject matter interested me so. Uh, my, my wife was there with me. She watched it. She was interested in it. She doesn't care about video games. Is that the um, same people that did King of Kong, or is that a different crew? I don't remember. I, I don't know enough about it. Because that's have you seen but, King of Kong? I have not. No. Yeah. Oh my god! It's like it's about uh, Donkey Kong. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, and there's the a whole that, the, subculture. Yeah, the, the, and they yes, do, yes. No, they videotape yes. themselves playing a game, and they have people that go out to people's houses. And we'll check like all the little EPROMs to make sure that nobody's tampered with their game. And they send videotapes of their like every second of their high playing game that took four or five hours or whatever, and uh, and uh, and set records that way. And uh, it's this fascinating, fascinating culture actually. Um, I'm really into all the weird old stuff like that, like just weird obscure stuff. I'm like, okay, these have these are nerds. That. I like them. You know, but and then that's. And that's the weird thing, uh, I guess, about about Blackmore because the secrets of Blackmore. Yeah, you're you're showing nerds. You're showing people that have been gaming this campaign for. Sometimes these are they, high caliber nerds. You know, yeah, they're high caliber nerds. But <laughs> yeah. you, 
watch this and again i mean i think one or two names i recognize but never saw or heard them mm -hmm. in the past and yet i'm watching this and i really do feel like i'm being brought into the basement where they're gaming and i can yeah. pull up the table and and play and that kind of Intimacy is not something that comes over very well in most documentaries. And I don't know if that was planned or if that was just ha happenstance because it really. It's just my style. Cool. You know, I've been working, I've been working with film and video. I think I started, I started buying uh, secondhand Super 8 cameras in stores, in thrift stores. You know, I'd buy a camera for 10, like back then, 12 bucks was a lot of money back in the 80s, you know. And uh, or twenty bucks or whatever, and uh, and then I ended up working at a PBS station. I studied video art. I wanted to be a video artist, but there's no money in video art. Okay. Um, so you see the the sort of like the old school video art in the movie, like the all the fog with the miniatures and stuff like that, or just some of the weirder. They're like they're prac. They're called practical effects. It's right. just like you know what happens in front of the camera and the lights. That's that's what was happening when we made it. Um, so uh yeah so and then i worked at pbs for about 12 years and then i worked as an editor for a while but i i have a real thing for i had weird bohemian parents and uh they would take me to movies i remember going to see godard films when i might have been three years old like <laughs> it was just like they would take me to weird art films they were into all kinds of weird art stuff so i began watching documentaries and weird art stuff from a very early age and there is sort of a there's, I think you have, to, you establish certain ethical boundaries on what, how you do these things. Um, and so the approach has to be, you have to maintain a certain, certain rules for yourself in how you approach making a movie like that. Um, because when you sit down with somebody, like, like I know a lot about gaming. I've done a lot of gaming. I'm a war gamer too. And so when I sit down with somebody that knows a lot about gaming, it would be easy for me to be instead of being the uh, interviewer to be like, Oh yeah, I love that game. You know, and suddenly it's a fanboy session. Okay. And so you're not getting, and so, but really what you want, what you want to know is, is uh, you want them to express uh, important things about gaming, you know, and that's kind of why I, I always say I, I put Gail Gaylord in there because she was the only one who would describe it without using gaming terms. And so I think that's one of the, like, there are two or three really key moments in the movie when she says it was all make believe. Mm -hmm. um, none of the guys would say it's make believe, and it's like, no. yeah, it's, what we're doing when we play Dungeons and Dragons or any other role playing game is we're playing make believe with rules. We have this make believe format called role playing, and as you describe what you do at certain points, it will require you to use a rule. It's a lot like object-oriented uh, computer programming. It's like you do a call for the oh, the door opening mechanic. I'm going to open the. I'm going to listen at the door. Oh, we need to use the rule for door open or door listening. Roll your die. Okay, you know you hear some noises. Okay, we're going to do our thing, and then we're going to kick the door in and run in and kill everything. Take his treasure. Okay, roll a die to see if you. You know now we need the rule for door opening. Roll your die to see if you open the door. Um, but everything else, if you're playing in the traditional style which is really how what Arneson invented and how he played with his players. They didn't use miniatures very much. It was all, I hate fear, the term. Fear know, of the mind. It's all yeah. make-believe. It's all make-believe. Um, um, so yeah, that, and then when, when Gary, uh, the, uh, David McGarry was another interview where he said this thing and I was like, it was in my head. The words were there. For, I had them. I couldn't tell him to do, it was, it's not ethical for me to tell him to say that. Um, it's not ethical for me to, you know prod him to say that but right. he said yeah it, that magic moment when you know what do you what do you want to do that's the turning point when the dungeon master says that's you know that's that's the essential thing it you know it, it can, that sentence can take a lot of different forms but you always have the narration where the dungeon master is establishing this is the state of the world or the universe that you're aware of in your surroundings you've got Walls going this way, drippy ceiling, slippery floor. There's a door at the end of the, of the passage. There's a gap halfway down off to one side. What do you want to do? That's, you know, that's the cue or, right. I mean, you know, and it seems sort of innocuous, but no other game uses that mechanic. 
in in role playing, right? Right, because it's it's open ended, and that's yeah. something that you know uh, until and then, again, that's something that um, you know Dave and, and and I'm sure you know influenced by you know Wesley Jenkins. Yes, that that but you know Dave started to uh, codify it. Put it into uh, a written form, and, and going back to to earlier, like people say, well, who's more important, Dave or Gary? Right. My, my my opinion is, without either one, you don't have Dungeons and Dragons. That's what I say too. I you mean, know, it, it's 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 like, you know, what's more important, the Oreo cookie, the cookie or the filling? Well, without both, yeah, you don't have an Oreo cookie. You know, it's you don't have a chocolate chip cookie without the chips and the meat of the cookie. You need both, and you don't yeah. have Americans without these two people because they both brought different skills to the table that made this a marketable endeavor. Which I don't think uh, Gary, well, Gary as a as own. a salesman, you right. know, they've got five hundred copies of this game. You know, what is it? Oh, it's this fantasy game. You you uh, you pretend that you're elves and orcs. Like what? You know. How do you convince uh, 500 people to buy a box game for $10 in 1974? When $10, I mean, that's probably like $50 today. Yeah. You know? um, that's a lot. It's a nice chunk. How do you comp compel people to buy something that is not, you know, like, does it have a board? No, no, you don't have a board. You have these maps. <laughs> you know, does uh, do you win? The maps? No, no, no. You got to draw them yourself. Who's, how do you determine who won? And it's like, well, you never really win and you just keep playing forever. You know, and you, you got to remember this is during this is during the war day, war game heyday, when right. rules were important, hexes hexes were important, chits were important, and then you're asking these people, hey, play a game with nothing. You, yeah. It's all it's going to be right up all here, and these, that's why there was a there was a big pushback from the war game people at the time because they, they just didn't understand it, it couldn't make any sense of it. I don't know. Was SPI even out yet when D and D yep. came out? Okay, SPI yeah, was there. Yeah. yeah. So you remember those like black tray? Like you buy the game and it was a black oh, yeah. tray. Oh yeah, the trays. Oh yeah, great. And an insert, a color insert cover thing, and you'd, you'd open it. They came with little tiny dice like that, and and uh, and then you'd have these massive rules, and it was all this very uh, uh, monopoly esque sort of controlled. You know, oh, yeah. you move here, uh, you can move yeah. there, you can't move there. You know, yeah, 3.5.6.2a. Yeah, <laughs> it's like a legal document. Yeah, yeah, it's like, oh my God. I mean, and I, I came into role playing first, and then I found war games. Mm -hmm. And my problem with war games is that I had like w one friend who wound up going into the Air Force, uh, Lenny, who would play them with me. Nobody else wanted to touch them with a 10 foot pole because, oh, uh, I like the like the double blind system from uh, Game Designers Workshop. I think right, that's a really cool way that works. But nobody wanted to play this game. The best I could get them to do is play Risk, but Risk isn't really. Come up you know, it's game. weird because it's like there was there's definitely that schism between the war gamers and the RPGers. But early on, if mm -hmm. you went, you didn't go to a role playing game. Well, I had an R a D and D club that I started in '77 and at the local library in Boulder, um, uh, but. The other gaming clubs were really war game clubs, and you'd go to the war game club. And I remember going one night, and it was like we played some D and D, and then we got done with D and D, and one of the guys had his fight in the skies game there, so we got out, fight in the skies, and we shot each other's planes down and fight in the skies. And um, <clears throat> and he was just, I mean, we we were all noob characters. Where he had his ace, and so he was just chalking up some three D three D kills for his for his ace character. And fighting skies, um, and then you know, and and there were tables around when we were playing D and D where guys had weird war games with a million little cardboard pieces on a hex sheet that they were pushing around for hours. Um, and so I don't know, it was just a, it was a different culture back then because it, there was I think a closer connection between the war gamers and the RPGers. I, and yeah, I, there, there there was a line. Because again, some people came into it without the wargaming background. Yeah, uh, the ones that came in from wargaming, it, it uh, the ones I knew that in college that had started with wargaming and came into gaming were a bit more structured in what they expected from their game, right? Or right. by the rules, as opposed to those of us that came in not even understanding what wargaming or role playing games were. 
and you kind of just kind of like, well, if you can't figure it out, you just kind of the group was in general just made up a rule that seemed to work, and you assumed that everybody played it that way. Yeah, Although, yeah. John Miller has an interesting point. It's interesting. A lot of the later TSR boxed RPGs came with maps and cardboard counters. Mark yeah, yeah. Watched the star from tier. Well, two. there was there was kind of a flip flop. Like I I see the um. Oh, there was something I did want to comment on because we were talking about that. But um, well, there there are good little. The problem was is that a lot of the war games were really big. But the uh, Steve Jackson, they're now Steve Jackson games. It used to be meta gaming. Meta, meta gaming, yes. yes Ogre G V. And yeah. it's funny, my 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 movie partner when he was young, he had just gotten out of college and he was really good with computers. And he applied for a job and they accepted him to work as like a programmer for Steve for. Uh, metagaming and then he decided to uh he was like yeah i'll just go into business for myself and he went off and did other things but we have these like brushes with with uh these sorts of things like throughout our lives but um they, they did like melee and wizard which were really war games with a fantasy bent you know mm -hmm. um like m melee is very strict sort of i mean you have elves and orcs and stuff but there's no magic so it's just a man-to-man -man combat system, but it's a nice little system. It works very well. And then they did um, Wizard, which was the magic system. Beautiful, beautiful. I mean, if you play the Wizard magic system, I think is one of, is still one of the best magic systems out there for for doing combats in an RPG type setting. Um, but yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. But we had that we had that element, that crossover element to the war game between the fantasy. You know, even Ogre, Ogre is kind of astounding. I was just looking at uh, YouTube videos on uh, tanks. I come, I'm a nerd. I like to look at stuff like that. And there's a modern look at, there's a modern tank that they're designing. They have prototypes for it. It looks like the heavy tank in or Ogre. Oh, really? Yeah. And I talked to Winchell. I think it was Winchell Chung who drew those. And I talked to him online and I'm going to have to send him a link and be like, Winchell, they're stealing your design. You need to see those people, you know, there's, See how angular that is? That's your tank. You designed that. <laughs> IP theft from the government. I was, my, my friends didn't consider Ogre to be a war game. It was a board game. They could play that. But it was the actual, I'm buying a game based on, like, you know, World War II or the Battle, mm -hmm. of, you know, the Battle of the Bulge or Vietnam. And it's like nobody nobody wanted to get anywhere close to it. But yeah. given science fiction and, and make it a, a science fiction war game, Ogre, GEV, uh, oh yeah, no, they were they were all in. I had car yeah. was basically. I have a. Um, we just did a Kickstarter for a, a World War II naval war game. During making the film, we found a lot of stuff. We'll get to the story of of Tonisborg in here in a little while. I don't know how long your shows are, but I can. Talk uh, we're we're on as long as we want to be. Yeah. On. Okay, I'll be yeah. here for about three hours if that's cool. No, <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> my bladder might have uh, five three hours. But... Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, we did a, the Kickstarter for the game. It was one of the things we discovered talking to the guys. Randy Hoffa was like, yeah, I have my game company, I released this game in 1978. It's it's a hybrid game because it's a board game with a hex boards, right? But it's a naval game, and you use little lead ships that are 1 to 4,800 scale. So they're just they're just minute little. They're beautiful, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and he was like, yeah, I got... 600 of these left we only ever printed 3,000 and then the printer shorted me on boards and I couldn't sell the rest and I was just too busy to get back to you know doing those because I was making miniatures um and so we did the kickstarter for that and um it didn't it you know it did okay it didn't do as well as we would have liked maybe um we sold a bunch and we're we're sort of halfway through fulfilling that one and um I was sort of looking at it and going like god you know if I took that game and turned all of those ships into spaceships, right, and the sea becomes space, and 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 then instead of saying like you know this is direct fire or in you know we've got torpedoes, we got rules for torpedoes and we got rules for for direct fire weapons. If the torpedoes are you know I don't know, they can space torpedoes and and the the cannons are laser cannons. Um, People would eat it up, right? We just repackage the yeah. game, the whole design. We wouldn't Probably change would. a thing. We just rename everything, you know. And then it would sell like gangbusters to the to the crowd, the the new gamer crowd because it's sci-fi. Um, I'm being a bit facetious, of course, but not really because <laughs> honestly, that is you. You can take, but listen, 
Uh, I think that uh, Old School Essential is, is a great repackaging of what is essentially Labyrinth Lord, which is essentially basic expert D&D. And right. it is doing... I didn't even check recently. It's probably it was over six hundred. I think it's close to seven hundred thousand now. Seven hundred thousand dollars yeah. for for um, basically a box set, of something that was already released a year or two ago. I already have my original. Right. Right. Um, but it is a presentation that connects not just to old school gamers, but to new school gamers. And I guess they don't even feel like they're playing an old school game because it has a new school presentation. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. there is something certain we said for how something is packaged, how it is skinned, because um, the flavor is almost uh, as important or in cases can be more important than the actual content. Yeah, yeah. Well, we used to buy like uh, there were a lot of there weren't a lot of sci fi games out back in the day. And I owned most of the ones that came out in by 19. I don't know, 1979. I probably owned every sci-fi game because I was kind of I was curious about sci-fi war gaming. And um, but a lot of them were like you're saying, it was like you bought it because the cover looked cool. The cover yeah. was cool, yeah, cool setting sort of idea. Um, and then you'd get the game, and it was like eh, it's not that great a game design. You know, there's that whole the the the, the there's the polarity between the simulation and and the and the speed of play. You know, mm -hmm. the more simulation you have, the more time it takes to to play the game. And so you'd get these like super, super duper simulate space reality simulation games that would take, you know, 24 I, hours to I, play. I, I, you know, Starfleet Battles. I don't know. I mean, I think I played Starfire, which was like a a poor man's version of Starfleet Battles, which mm -hmm. played a little bit quicker. And yeah. uh, our science fiction go to game of all things was Amoeba Wars from uh, Avalon Hill. Because I remember we, seeing that. That was one I did not have. Oh yeah, no, we, we played the shit out of that because it was it, it it ran fairly quickly. It was a hoot, and it literally was a, required you to use your imagination in a way. You were kind of it became mm -hmm. a fun game because you were role playing. Mike there has it. it. Yeah, oh my there god, it is. there you go. <laughs> it's it's on my shelf here. Yep, yeah. it's up here in the shelf. And we played the shit out it of it. It all made the wars. You know, well, you know, and that's kind of the the other thing is is the tendency for gamers to want to um, upscale. The, the, it happens with every game, like like the the uh, creep of scope. Uh, you know, it's okay that we're first level characters, but what if we just all run like twentieth level characters right from the get go? And you know, or or why don't can you know the DM can you just give my first level character that plus three sword so I can you know do more. Um, and you see it in the, uh, even with Starfleet Battles, the original game was just that little, it was in a little plastic bag. Right. Little rule book, fold out, print, uh, die cut counters, fold out board, a couple dice, five bucks. Um, beautiful game. But then everybody wanted to run the Dreadnought because that was the big Federation ship. And um, <clears throat> um, I don't know, I always thought, thought it was interesting because I was the, I've always been the opposite. It's like, can we get out the frigates? Um, and so like, how good are you? Can you, can you fly three frigates and, and do a good game? I mean, the, the people just wanted to barge in and blow the crap out of everything with the giant ships. It, it's sort of death star syndrome maybe, but you see it in RPGs too. Like, uh, 5e is completely, uh, uh, inflated on, on character abilities compared to earlier. I mean, every, and it's not just 5e, every edition. Every you know what you're right. Every edition has, and even every sub edition, right? Like AD and D added exceptional strength. That was the big thing that really pumped up the volume. And then uh, an Earth Arcana added in specialization, which uh, yeah. supposedly was to help uh, fighters uh, match the strength of uh, magic users. But all you did was yeah. Well, anytime you look at a. But if you look at any kind of poll role gamers, when they when they group like what what are what are your favorite levels to play one through three five through seven that whatever, it, it almost always is the lower levels. For some reason, people love to have that feeling that look, I, I'm just one sword blow away from death or destiny here, you know, or one spell away, and, and it almost seems like when they get because I, I know my own group we've been playing since '78. 
and okay. you get to that point when you're about ninth or tenth level, you're like, you know, this is too easy. Well, let's start. Right, we're gonna right. start over. Yeah. We, we got to start this thing over again. But yeah, there, there's power gamers too. But I, I think people just love to play that just hard scrabble. You know, hey, I got we got just enough money to buy the fighter either a chainmail or a sword. We can't buy them both. So what are we gonna do? We got yeah. we got to do something. Well, we were talking kind of about flavor of game. I'm looking at the sidebar, and so I saw John Miller was asking a question yep. about. Um, the original rules and notes for Blackmore. So I thought I'd just talk about that yeah. a little bit. Go ahead. Um, there's a lot of conjecture about what Arneson was doing. I mean, that's the problem with, with Arneson is that he was never a really good proponent for his own story. Um, he, he would say facetious things like, I didn't type a single word of the rules or there are no rules, which isn't true. He's actually making deeper comments with all those. Every time he would say something like that, um, I've seen, uh, um, I don't know. I see people interpret, the other other historians interpret his writings very literally, and they don't understand that he's being facetious, and he's actually sort of saying something deeper. Often he has kind of a, he has a quirky, he has nerd humor, very um, 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 like ironic, sarcastic nerd humor, right. but it's deadpan, you know. And um, <clears throat> so we don't really know a lot about what Arneson was doing early on. That's one of the things I want to, you know, the first the first movie, you only have, you sit down with somebody and you wear them out in about four hours. They're just like, okay, I've had enough. <laughs> you oh, know? God, I'm sure. And um, I mean, there were brutal interviews for most of the people. It's like it, most people aren't used to being uh, sort of interrogated for four hours about something they did. And also it's like, I did this 50 years ago, you know, it was 1970, 1971. Um, I can't really remember every little detail, you know, I can't, I know I can't remember my first games I played. I have a vague recollection of playing a game of D and D before, but I might have had the dungeon master D and D before I actually ever played it. I think maybe, um, without really knowing, you know, I just kind of made up what I thought role playing was based on what I had and, in Holmes at the time. Um, but anyway, we don't really know a lot about what he was doing. We found some some fragments um, that John Snyder had written some rules. There were the rules, you probably heard of the, don't, the Beyond This Point Be Dragons rules that were floating around. I actually heard of them, never seen a copy or... Okay, and that was the other thing is uh, the people would find these things and uh, there's a researcher out there that when he goes and gets these things from people, he makes them find sign non-disclosure agreements. They're not allowed to tell anybody that they anything about, you know, what transaction happened. And so this person is like locking in. It's sort of doing this weird legal lock in on IP by making people sign non-disclosure agreements. It's really sleazy and anti-research. But um, um, so uh, that got out because the person who found it was mailing scans around to people. And so I, I got into the research community on OD and D 74 and I was like, well, I have a copy. Somebody sent me a copy, right. you know, I don't own it. If you're doing research, just send me an email that says I am a, a an independent researcher interested in Dungeons Dragons. And I will send you a copy of this manuscript and you can see something that existed early on when D and D was being, created um i'm kind of lo losing my thread but so we have that fragment you know um i think uh there are researchers out there like john peterson who have entire manuscripts that they found that sort of give you an idea of of where D, &D was going but that's all uh post gary and dave working together right pre, pre gary and dave working together what arneson was doing was he had a notebook it's the infamous black notebook and i'm not even sure if it was just a spiral bound notebook that had a black cover or if it was back then, you know, a notebook was a fold pop, out with a ring that you'd pop open and put your paper in and close it. It right. might have been a, a black bound notebook. And when he ran Blackmore, he was essentially writing rules and making up rules on the fly. And so the system was incredibly flexible because it was being created as they played. It was, it was totally seat of your pants. And, um, you know, he said he used uh, he used a little bit of. I mean, it's it's weird because even when you say there there really isn't any 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 correlation between what you see in the uh, in chainmail for systems because 
the systems in Chainmail actually aren't mechanically the same as what gets created for D and D later. But um, um, we have another little thing that we haven't published yet. I helped Dan get it. Uh, Dan found this thing called the he calls it I called it the Snyder variation because I like chess variations, you know. So we think that John Snyder wrote that, or not John, um, Richard Snyder wrote it, and it's a spinoff of Arneson's rules, and it specifically says, you know, our like our mass combat will use the Arneson system for our, our man-to-man combat, we're using something else. But it is like about six pages of rules for playing an RPG, and as far as we can tell, those are the only rules for the RPG. That's all they used. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And that's something, so, and I don't think, I think that it predates Chainmail, the, the release of Chainmail, maybe. I don't think it's based on Chainmail. Um, there's a lot of confusion because I think that in retrospect, you know, people's memories are sort of odd as far as how you remember things. Chainmail didn't get published till after Arneson had already been playing Blackmore. Okay. So there are historians who will say, oh, well, he had a draft copy. Gary sent him a draft copy. And it's like, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, I think what he had of Chainmail was just the um, um, an earlier version of it that might not have had like the fantasy supplement in it. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's I don't I see. I don't like to say that something is a certain way. I don't I don't I don't claim certainty on things. It's just there's this very weird, blurry area where Arneson is starting to do these things. Um, Greg Svensson and a couple other cl- players claim that they did their first dungeon adventure in uh, on Christmas of 1970. Okay, there's no evidence to support it that I know of. There's no evidence to deny that fact. Right. Um, and and uh, so it's possible that Arneson did his adventure. You know, maybe four months be- before people think Blackmore started. Um, because and then it's interesting because the way the tone he talks about. If you read his uh, posts in the in the corner of the tabletop fanzine that he wrote, there is a certain familiarity, even in the very first announcements of the game, that make it sound like they might have already been doing this already. It's it, and, um, so yeah, I'm, I you know to me it's sort of like we have this amorp- amorphous space. Um, Dwayne Jenkins might have been doing his uh, Western thing as early as October of 1970, so you got a Western role playing game there that is. That is a campaign. It's more than you know. Wesley is doing the the one off games that are very character focused. All the action is between characters. They're not. They're using the the environment, but but the objectives are all between characters. So it's kind of like a, a diplomacy game, right? Okay. Then you got Dwayne Jenkins who's doing that, but then you have these characters that persist over time. So next game session, you come in, you're still Jesse, you know. Jesse James, and you're still, you know, Poncho Villa, you're, you know, uh, or El Poncho, that was Dave Arneson's character, El <laughs> Poncho. Um, and uh, um, so, you you know, that's the campaign coming, the campaign element coming into that format. Um, and then Arneson does the, the fantasy version, which it could be it started as early as Christmas of 1970, because there are people who claim, based on their own life, things that were happening in their lives, they were like, I, you know, I had just gotten married or I had just gotten my, my driver's license or whatever, you know, and and it was right after that, that I started playing. Um, So back to the big question is like, we don't know what Darnison was doing. You know, that's the big thing about really the, the, Mm -hmm. the, the, the calling the movie secrets of Blackmore. And then it's going to be a follow-up. If we make enough money, we'll do a follow-up right now. We're kind of broke. Um, But uh, that probably the whole focus of the next film will be tracing what rules we we can find from Arneson. And I think that when he published uh, First Fantasy Campaign, that was in 77. So he was probably working on it for a while. And and it's really, uh, he was used to working with Gary. Um, And when he worked with Gary, it's like Gary really took on the role of editor. And so even when Tim Kask is like, oh, you know, he was an idiot, he didn't do anything. And, And one of the things that Kask did not, doesn't say is that every supplement they made at TSR, they had these baskets and they would load them up with papers. And so there was a Greyhawk basket and a 
Blackmore basket basket and an Eldritch Wizardry basket basket. And that's how they would begin a, a supplement. They would just gather all these disparate materials and then they'd go through it and start to write what seemed like would be would work well. And so when he says that Arneson gave me this basket of notes, it's like, yeah, you're the editor. It's your job to make it look good, you know. And and the Blackmore supplement is actually a pretty crappy supplement. And I think that the person responsible for that is probably Tim Cask, and he won't admit it because he didn't really act as editor the way Gary would have. And, um, um, you know, but what we do get out of the Blackmore supplement is a the first Dungeons and Dragons module, which is Dave Arneson's Temple of the Frog. Um, and that kind of gives you an idea of how, how Arneson was running his games, which was in a very sort of real world setting. It was a living world, you know. Um, but yeah, rules, I don't know. It's like, we don't really know. I mean, Arneson talks about, he talked, it, it's interesting because we found enough fragments that he talked about all, he basically all the stuff that people think is new to D&D or to the rules for RPGs. Um, Arneson in one of the, I think it was the Space Gamer interview, he talked about all these things that he was like, we did, we tried spell points, we tried skills, we tried this, we tried that, you know? And and uh, now as we go back through, we're starting to see evidence that it, where, where people, he was always sort of considered a big liar and that, you know, he didn't really do much. And it was like, oh, no, no. He, before Gary Gygax even saw this thing, Dave Arneson had done so much with it and tried so many options. And his rules were really kind of a moving target. Um, so that's kind of my big you know, spiel about the rules. Um, we might find out more, but what I expect we'll find out is that the rules were very streamlined and that uh, because I've seen rules, other rules that Arneson has written, I have uh, some naval rules that he wrote, um, which are like, four pages and there's a page missing sadly um but there's no no contextual prose like you see in most rule books it's literally charts and and graphs and lists and you're just supposed to understand like you know it'll just say like you know ship ship hull size chart you know list of different grades of ships damage points cross-referenced gun type and so I expect that Arneson's D&D rules, his Blackmore rules would have been really similar. It would have been just some sheets of paper. And from right. what we know, he, he, when he did, I'm kind of wandering. When he, when he we did, do, come on. Am I making sense so far? Yes. Okay, when he finally sent a draft to Gary, because Gary um, was desperate to see this game, um, he sent him what, what's described in the forward to the Blackmore supplement as a, uh, um, 16 or 18 pages of rules. Okay. And the only, one of the people, only, uh, only other people to have seen it was, um, um, Rob Koontz and Rob Koontz says he saw a lot of linear equations. Really? Yeah. And so it was very much, it's very brainy stuff, you know, and Gary was just like, this is garbage. We can't use that. You know, people like charts, you know, and he was right. People are, most gamers aren't, going to want to do linear equations when they're playing their RPG. They want charts. Right. And so, uh, um, um, yeah, so they just kind of converted what Arneson had been doing with his equations to, to more chart-oriented system. And Arneson, there really isn't anything in Chainmail to use in a role-playing game. I mean, there's almost nothing, okay? And so it's interesting because Gary is trying to sell and I don't, you know, I don't think that Gary's being a jerk. He's got another game out. You got two commodities. If I can sell this commodity that I get a dollar from, and I can sell this commodity that I get a dollar from twice, you know, to, to the same person, right. I've doubled my income, right? So Gary starts to, Gary is very pleased with his chainmail game, and he starts to ingest, inject it into D&D &D when D&D &D is created. Is That's my suspicion, because Arneson was working away from, from chainmail, because it just didn't have the meat in there to support the system he wanted. Whereas when Gary got involved, he was working to inject chain mail back into it and make it sort of uh, compatible, you know? So there's, there's the, the mythology, like the, the, you know, the birth of RPGs being in chain mail. It's just kind of like, well, it just doesn't work, you know, because the RPG, the, the, the play style is evolving early on 
and it has nothing to do with chain mail. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you see what Arneson did and the sort of stuff he was creating, uh, he was moving away from chain mail. He wanted other things. He wanted skills, you know, and it's interesting. I mean, he, he, and people want to see like things that look exactly the same, but, but uh, if you look at empire of the petal throne, most of the people who were involved in, in Barker's group were like, Oh, he wrote it in two weeks and he, you know, got it out. We were playing. And it's like, mm, no, I don't think so. Cause there's the 1974 edition of empire of, of uh, petal throne that he gave to his players, the Mimeo edition. There's an earlier draft. That's almost identical that, that um, Barker did. And then uh, two, two important artifacts were found in Barker's estate um, that were found by Keith DeLoon, the DeLoon manuscript, which is now being referred to as the Bufkin manuscript because uh, Dan ba uh, Boggs traced it back to this guy, Dan B Bufkin in Minnesota, up in uh, D Duluth, Minnesota. And, um, and the, the Snyder variant, I think, is associated with that. And then there was also a, I think, a D and D draft in with that. I can't, I don't know because Keith can't talk to me. But um, uh, um, the, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just like people wanting to control shit. It just pisses me. This pardon my language. It just no, I don't, dude. We dropped. Like, I just want to do research, right? I just want to know where this stuff is. If I find out something, I'll tell you. And right. if I have things that I like. If I have something I want to use for the movie, it's like, well, I can't really show it to you for a couple of years, or, or if it's, if you if we work together, I'll be like, yeah, I'll show it to you, but please don't publish, you know, anything on it till the movie comes out, or publish and say that you got it from the crew of Secrets of Blackmore, and right? Then, you know, help us market our next movie. But um, um, where was I going with that? Uh, oh yeah, this so. If you look at Empire of the Petal Throne, one of the things you see is that uh, Barker used a different approach, which was this idea of skills. And that was something that Arneson talked about using with skills in his game. And so clearly they've had some discussion about how to conduct a D&D &D game type game. And, and, uh, and uh, Barker is seeing early editions of D&D &D before he, he released his game, I think, 75. Um, but his, his system is kind of a skill-based system where you 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 have a you you roll to see how many skills you get, and then when, when you gain levels, you get more skills with each level. Um, it's kind of wonky because it's such an early system, right? Um, but uh, that's a good example of like there's probably an influence there from Arneson. I think that Arneson and Barker were probably talking a lot because they were in the same same town. Arneson's going to the same school. Arneson is a history student. Barker's a, 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 a linguistic, a, a linguist um, there. Um, so, yeah, so you, you know, but I think that you're going to see back to, you know, circling back, the rules are going to be really simple, mm. but um, I think they're lost. You know, I think we, all we can do is, is, is uh, infer from what we find um, what Arneson was doing. Um, but, uh, if you, I don't know, uh, who was it? It was Miller, I think was his last name. Probably yeah, John. Originally. Yeah. I worry that I'm boring you cause I can just, no, write no, dude, history stuff. Dude, dude, this is awesome. Now, One of the artifacts that we found was, uh, uh, we were going through Dan Nicholson's collection and we found uh, the, uh, little sheet, which later became known as the, uh, Spanish Royals character matrix. And it's a character sheet for a whole Royal family. And it has six stats across the top and you know a whole family of characters and their like royal advisor down right. the side and it has two die rolls for all of their stats and um um you know that it's like something like that it's like well that's looks like the first character sheet to me and it's dated 1971 oh, um, and it's dated to the very same day where dave arneson says he's going to run his first blackmore game in the corner of the tabletop I don't know. But, um, you know, there are things like that that carry forward into the game that you'll find like that. I mean, that's that was astounding when we just, I mean, it says scrap of paper like this, right? But it was like a bomb going off, you know, when we saw it, it was just like, oh my God, this is like, the, this is the first character sheet, you know? Um, anyway, let's talk about other stuff because I can go into all of them. Why don't you tell us about Tonisburg? Because uh, okay. I, I saw that from, um, I, I thought that was amazing. It's amazing. 
I think it's really cool. So tell us a little bit about Thomasburg. Well, Thomasburg was one of the things that we found. We found so many things when we were researching the movie. Um, we have whole drafts of games that were never published. Um, and so Thomasburg was this set of rules. We were doing an interview. We would do these interviews where we'd sit around in McGarry's living room or in his dining room. And we get Ross and McGarry and Leslie together. And we, so there's them, th those three on one side of the table. And then me and Chris and, and Ryan, our, our local, local guy that was part of our crew on the other side of the table. And then we'd start sloshing some scotch a little bit into glasses and we'd just sip scotch and talk. And I would, those interviews were interesting because I would let them kind of go off on tangents. And a lot of it is stuff that we never used in the movie. Like, um, there's a whole section where I just, I was like, you know, I really, you know, it's, it's sad that Dan Nicholson died a year before we started the movie. Cause I would have like Dan probably knew things that nobody else knew. And so they told me all about Dan Nicholson and, um, all the stuff, how significant he was. He was the first person to bring a computer to Gary, to uh, Gen Con. You know, nobody knows who Dan Nicholson really? is. Yeah, he brought like an IBM, like mini computer, still huge. You bring it in on a pallet, you know. Right. Um, and then he was the one who actually built David Wesley's uh, computer for uh, the, the Strategos combat computer. Like Wesley sort of designed it conceptually and Dan implemented it as far as the electronics. So they did that one together. Um, anyway, so they were talking and, and, and McGarry's like, oh, I have something in the basement. And he just bolts out of the room. And we're chattering away and he shows up and he's got these maps and he starts showing the maps to us. And we're looking and, I, and the minute I looked at him, I was like, those are not, those didn't come out of Lake Geneva. They're weird maps. They have all these angled passages. They're blank spaces. They look like real catacombs, like you would find in a tomb, or right. you know, you look at old archaeological. Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, if you're a gamer, you're going to look at your old National Geographic's for ideas for maps, and they, they always do something right. And there's always gaps with, that are just stone and passages, winding passages. That's what these looked like. And so, um, I think it was McGarry mentioned he was like, yeah, I think that's Thomas Borg. You know, and, and uh, we were looking at the keys for the rooms and one of the rooms listed knolls. And so we were like, well, this has to, it, you can't have knolls before D&D &D is released because knolls were created by Gary Gygax in, in the game. So this comes from a time when D&D &D is either being prototyped or, you know, or, or, uh, or has just been released. And so um, when I went to do... Uh, the interview down in Florida with uh, Greg Svensson, I mentioned to him in the interview, I was like, you know, we think we found your maps to your dungeon. We're not sure yet, though. And I was just too busy to do anything. When Dan Boggs got a hold of me, he's like, that's got to be Thomas Borg. So he just emailed him to Greg, and Greg was like, yeah, that's my handwriting on oh, the maps. Wow. You know? Hmm. And there's a whole story that goes with how they were lost, and um, they're, they're cool. I mean, I... Uh, Yes. I mean, the scans are, are amazing. I mean, they, yeah, they are very good. Very, very. I mean, this is the kind of thing you could just look at and get ideas just by flipping through the pages and looking at the, the maps. Yeah. The maps are amazing. And they're, and they're not the originals. They're, they're, um, they're scans, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're not scans. They're the Xerox copies or whatever, you know, Really? yeah, the originals were lost. And, uh, and that's, I mean, it's a long story. Basically, David McGarry was supposed to make copies. He took them with him to make copies. He made copies. He had them in a magazine. He set them on a, on a coffee table and then went to, to sleep because he worked the night shift, the graveyard shift. When he got up, the cleaning lady had thrown away the magazine and it was also garbage day. So the garbage had been taken away. Oh, oh. So, I mean, I just feel bad. You know, McGarry's like maybe 23 years old or something like like. You know, your, your, your best friend, one of your best, I mean, those guys are tight, you know, like right. your best friend, one of your best friends in this group of guys that are super tight and loyal to each other. Like they are, they are a band of brothers. That's what Greg Svensson says. We're like a band of brothers, like in the movie, you know, and, uh, and to have to like, be like, man, I lost your, like, I lost your dungeon, your 10 level mega dungeon forever. It's done. And, um, but then this other copy that maybe Arneson had given it to McGarry um, 
appeared in a bunch of boxes that Meharry had that were still back in the Twin Cities at his parents' house. And so he hung on to that. And uh, um, so, you know, and then, I mean, we were just like, yeah, let's do a book. Dan and I wanted to do a game book. And uh, it was sort of a, I just didn't think there was a lot of material out for Dungeon Masters that's good material. What, what I good, I mean, my opinion of good. Um, uh, and so I wanted to do a book and maybe call it like something like A Thousand and One Passages. Like there's a book, there are these chess books, A Thousand and One Chess Problems. And so I wanted to play off of that and do like maybe A, a Thousand and One Passages. Uh, but I think there's a book by a similar name already out there. So maybe we couldn't do that. But um, once we got Tonisborg, it was like, let's just merge our instructions on how to be a dungeon master with Tonisborg and do uh, um, sort of a mishmash of this is the way we used to do it. There are some things that you can use that are a little bit maybe more modern techniques um, that you can also incorporate. But we're still going to stay within the format of uh, traditional role playing um, because, you know, we don't need miniatures. Um, we don't need to play act, we, but we do interact with the environment and the, and the, and the environment is this make-believe fantasy environment that's created collectively between referee and players. Um, and so we just wrote, you know, uh, I already had a bunch of stuff written down, so we just started writing. It took about two and a half years to write it. Um, it took us a while to get it all out there. I mean, we're, we're a tiny company. Chris has other companies he runs. He kind of uses his other companies to fund these projects, you know. So, uh, um, you know, those are the things. Those those are the the, the bread and butter is the, the real companies, not the game companies. So when mm -hmm. something's going on with that, the game companies go on hold a little bit. So sometimes we're a little bit delayed on our delivery on things. Right. Um, but unlike most, uh, well, not most. Unlike a lot of the companies that do things like Kickstarters. Uh, we're just like, we're, we're going to finish it. You know, like we, we can't not finish it. And I think that's part of like when going back to the movie that one of the things that Chris and I joke about is that we were just too stupid to not finish our movie. <laughs> <laughs> like we're just idiots, you know, it's like, we're going to do a D and D movie and we, and we do it, you know, and it's like, and it's not, there's no genius there. It's just like, we're just too stupid to stop, you know? Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was like, and then we had a lot of drama. Um, it was unfortunate. There was a lot of drama that happened around Bob Bledsaw. He was supposed to be the original artist. And, oh, that's uh, right. Yeah. All, all the judge. Yeah. The, you were. Yeah. The, I remember that you issued something about we're not going to do this with Judges Guild anymore at the time. Yeah. And it really sucked because yeah. I, uh, I think that it was like one sentence and I don't want to go into all that, but there's this whole thing of like, yeah. yeah. Being, oh, yeah. The whole cancel culture thing. Yeah, we were very familiar I knew that with Bob everything. Yeah. I mean, uh, I had been following him on Facebook, and I knew that he was politically. His view is that he's not. He does not support Israel. Okay, and so there was a comment about Jewish people, and he used the term "the Jews," I think, or something like that. You know, and and, and uh, I won't go into it. Oh no! And right? Suddenly, he became this huge anti-Semite. You know, and it's like, no, I don't think he is, and. You know, he's this huge racist, and it's like, yeah, but this is the guy that keeps posting, like, these vintage, like, 1930s film clips of old African-American blues singers, you know, women and men. Um, and so, and then, of course, now I'm a gatekeeper because I'm, I'm like, saying, like, no, he's okay. He's an okay racist, you know, or he's an okay. And, and uh, I don't want to go down that road, but um, we just felt like we couldn't, you know, it was like we're a small company we can't come out of the door with our first product and have that sort of mark on it. Yeah. So we had to rescind um, that. And uh, which is unfortunate because we had uh Bledsaw's art is, is spectacular. Um, the cover piece he had done was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it was just, but the, the, you know, it was, it was just, that just the, the finest RPG OSR traditional fantasy art you could find. And um, so we were like, okay, we've just lost our lead artist and we don't have any art really. And we're just screwed right now. So we put out the word and people started saying, you know, like uh, Vaughn Allen, who does, he does a comic. Why is my brain damaged? Look up Vaughn Allen comics. 
you know, great comic book artist. He did one of the full page spreads of the people in the dungeon that's in the book. Um, here, I'll just pull it out while we're talking. Um, Wolf, Wolf's Head? Uh, Wolf's Head. Yes. Yeah, he does Wolf's Head, you know. And I'm, and actually, I, I got some copies and read it, and I was like, it's a slow burn on the story, but once you're in it, you are you want to know what happens next, you know. And I mean, that's really like what most great literature is like, you know. Mm -hmm. it's like once you're right. in it. This one, um, I have trouble aligning it on the camera there, but I don't know if you can see it very well, but. That's no, the art. The art in this book is second mm -hmm. to none. And, the, and, the, and, and I think we, we talked about this prior that the, the layout, the font, all of that just it, it, it almost bleeds AD&D 1E in its, in its feel. And it's yeah, I just wanted to finish talking about the artists. So, so all these artists volunteered to do art. Um, you know, this is the other thing you run into when you deal with all the political stuff. Two of the artists are, I think one, I can, I am sure that one is trans and I think another one is trans. Um, um, so, you know, whatever, when you get into all that, I mean, I hate it. I hate all that stuff. I just want to play my games. But um, um, we, we got two artists, those two artists, we got a guy in Denmark. Is it Denmark? I think it's Denmark, Sweden, Sweden, volunteered his art. We found a guy in England to redo the maps. Um, we found they were, nice, they were nicely redone too. I gotta say, they, yeah, they're, they're beautiful. Really... They look like uh, the, the Dyson logo style. Mm -hmm. maps. It's very contemporary to today's map making. Um, and then we also got um, Ken Fletcher and uh, Walter Moore, and and that was kind of a cool like we, the reason we wanted Bledsaw was because he had done the art in uh, first fantasy campaign. And we're really into keeping this sort of lineage going on all these things as long as we can. And so it'd be kind of fitting that he did, you know, a lot of the art and maps in First Fantasy Campaign. And now he's doing this Blackmore thing, you know, uh, 40 something years later. So Walter Moore was the artist who did uh, the artwork on some of um, Arneson's modules that were published in different worlds um, back in the 70s. And then, and, and, uh, the other artist, of course, was Ken Fletcher, who worked at Adventure Games and was, was one of the house artists at Adventure Games. And so there's like we, you know, we wanted to keep some people in there that would create this idea of lineage within the Arneson uh, world milieu and product creation history. Anyway, so that's I just had to finish that. Not. I mean, Tonisburg, the, the, it, it is something that. Each of its component parts are awesome. Like looking at the original work and seeing those scans uh, brings me back to my early days of, of gaming. Certainly has that feel. Then, again, the layout, the uh, font used is very much uh, AD&D 1E specifically. I, think it's, it's, it, I mean, we copied the... This is, this is a direct copy of the Dungeon Master's Guide as far as fonts it's and awesome. columns. And uh, um, it's the same size font. It is the same font. All the layout. I think we did one change on, uh, like, the, uh, we sort of did an upgrade to the charts. Uh, if you look at our charts, like in the DMG, I mean, these are DMG looking charts, right? This is, they established the standard. So right. we just put, like, a little tiny, where is it? There's a tiny line right at the bottom of the chart that's gray right there on all the charts and we just felt it would help contain the chart if we added a little tiny gray line at the bottom that's not in the dmg but that might be the only difference between the whole layout of this book and uh and, and what you find and it's a very high quality book i mean not not that i want to go back to, uh, yes and you're I mean, running a game and, you want to mark your spot right you know yeah, i, I actually right I, it reminded me of being back in college when i would spend like $140 on a textbook for history class. But you got something that would last you a lifetime. I still have a few of these books in my closet. Now they're just made out of crap uh, yeah. print on demand. They, they just fall apart. Yeah. You drop it and it, the binding falls apart. Yeah. No, yeah. These are, um, that was the other thing we wanted to do. Um, that was kind of my thing. I was like, you know, if we're going to do a book and we're doing a limited edition run, like 
I didn't really think we'd do more than one printing and it would just be this obscure little tome that some that our, our Kickstarter supporters got. Um, and so I was like, we're going to only do it in hardbound and, and um, we're going to have them hardbound here in the United States by hand, by, by crafts people that, that, you know, have been binding books for 50 years, you know? And so, and that's another thing is like, you know, this, this isn't like, you know, this is, I, I, I'm not crazy or nationalistic or anything, but this is an American product. It's made in America. It, you know, this, the, the money that you spend on the product, we distribute to people in America and, and also locally to craftspeople in our city of Denver, where you can get like this archival quality work still done with, with a dye, you know, that, that does a gold print and gold printing there. And, a ribbon and fabric. And this is the know. this is the first the first printing, right, Griff? Is, yeah. Is second printing is going to come out. Soon yeah. Well, or... we're we well we we're doing we we've already started taking orders on our website for the second printing, and the second printing actually will be a little bit different. It's still the same edition, right? Um, it'll be different because the second printing will actually stay in the cover, official Blackmore, and it'll it'll be licensed through the uh, the. <clears throat> the Dave Arneson estate who hold the trade name of Blackmore now. And um, that's a, like kind of a weird secret behind the scenes stories. But we, uh, we worked with Justin Lanasa and uh, Lanasa felt that the uh, Dave Arneson estate should have the, um, the trade name for Blackmore, which he had bought. And so he arranged with his lawyer to transfer it to the estate and, um, and we paid for it basically and, and kind of faci facilitated so that's why, you know, like people have a lot of problems with Justin Lanasa. And I'm just like, you know, he, he did the right in that one thing. He did do the right thing. And I think he deserves respect for that, you know. And and um, so this will be the first, you know, black like official black milk product that comes out that is actually licensed by the estate because there is other stuff that was not licensed by the estate out there that is uh, kind of questionable. And um um, and we're going to keep doing stuff like this as long as we can to kind of bring like traditional Blackmore ideas into like and up, update them into um, a modern kind of modern play style with traditional. I don't know. There's there's a blending of the two. It's a mindset. You know, you can bring in new ideas, but if you're in the mindset of traditional role playing, it will all fit together. Um, that was kind of the, the mindset behind like the DCC RPG, I guess. Right. It was like using newer mechanics, but with the mm -hmm. old school right. set behind it. I, I, well, plus, I, yeah, plus good, 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 good wanted to own their own system too. I mean, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. Part of it. Um, so, uh, what else can I say about this book? I don't know. I'm just like, really, I'm really pleased with it. Um, Dan Boggs had written a set of rules called champions of Zed, which were like, a they were like, uh, what do you call it? The licensing deal that they do for D and D OSR rules. I forgot what it's called, but you can you can uh, use the original D and D rules to make your own game, but you have to like uh, use their licensing. So he did a system like that, and uh, it's in the back. Um, he did a, a system like that, and so we just took that system and stripped out everything that related to dungeon adventuring and and just didn't republish the wilderness adventure stuff in it. And so we have, uh, you know, it's it's like, I mean, it's really a, there's there's a lot in there. It's like you've got a you've got this historical element of Greg Svensson talking about they, he made this dungeon in 1973 before D and D was published using a draft of D and D, you know, and then it gets lost and that story's in there. And then we pick it up with this is how we played the game in the old days when you didn't have any rules and this is how you would cope with situations that would require rules that you would just make them up on the fly and, you know, see to your pants RPG. Um, but anyway, we're, uh, we, Oh, I get lost. I babble. That's also because I forgot to eat before doing this. Um, we uh, are selling them. You can, you can get them on our, our website, secrets of blackmore.com store.secrets of blackmore.com. You can pre-order there a uh, hundred dollars. They're expensive. I'm not, you know, but they're they're very, well worth they're well worth a hundred dollars for for the for just the quality alone. The quality yeah. is excellent. My girlfriend was is uh um 
works, you know, used to work well. She's a writer. She's been around writing and books and whatever, publishing. And she saw it and she was like, that's like a coffee table art book. Like you should. Oh, yeah. You know, like if you went, you wanted to try like to find an art book like that with text and art in it, it might cost you a lot more than $100. It might be more like $300. So it's kind of, we, you know, sort of found a happy medium on pricing where it's like, here's your expensive D&D art book that you can leave on your coffee table. I mean, I, I could do the Bill Webb thing and, and hold the book and just do this and say, look how great the binding is and you can shake it. And <laughs> and I, I haven't tried that yet. I mean, for all right. I know, they just fall right out. You know? No, they don't. <laughs> no. It, it is, I mean, it, again, it reminds me of, again, of the college textbooks that you got in yeah. every subject, the history ones. Because the history ones, the assumption was, I, I suspect, is that history isn't going to change much and you'll be reselling this and somebody will have it for like the 19th year and this book will still be viable and still be in mm -hmm. a great condition because they are built to last. And this book is certainly built to last. Well, and I mean, I don't want to pick on Pathfinder because I, I actually, when I tried Pathfinder, I thought the, it was a compelling game system. I just found it too slow playing, but it was very, uh, uh, it's kind of elegantly all based on a sort of a, a binding mechanic, you know, for everything. One rule to rule them all, as it were. And, and but um, but uh, I also have seen Pathfinder books where they use that uh, slick comic book cover paper, oh, in God. full color, yeah. and all the color has been wiped off the cover, like it's just mm. white, and the color's wiped off. And then um, they're using perfect binding, but they're whoever's doing the perfect binding for them might be they're skimping on the glue or something. And so, uh, um, the, basically the pay, you know, you open it and the, the, the pages explode out, you know? And, and I think that a lot of the new D and D uh, books are like that too. I, I suspect I don't own any, I just own a, a starter set, but, um, um, that was the thing that was part of it is like, you know, like this will outlive you, you know? Yeah. And, um, the other thing we want to do, so you can order it now. We're also going to do a Kickstarter. What we're going to try to do is once we launch the Kickstarter, we're going to go ahead and try to order. I mean, I can't promise anything because honestly, like supply chain stuff is still stupid just because of COVID. Like mm -hmm. it's just on every level. We had the same problem with the map boards we had to reproduce for the Naval game. We got half or we didn't get any. They couldn't find the chipboard. Then we got half. Now we finally have the second half. And we're trying to we're assembling the games. I was doing that all night last night. Um, but um, what I want to do is also maybe provide through the Kickstarter, and people can upgrade if they want. Is a, a hand stitched edition. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's something that people would value. I mean, it would be pricey because it's expensive to hand stitch a book. Yes. You know? it's somebody uh, mm. you know. I mean, it was always expensive to hand stitch a book. You know, it's like somebody has to sit there with a sewing machine. I think, or maybe a big needle. Maybe it's just a big needle <laughs> and, and the pages and they stitch the, you know, and the pages are done in chunks. So they stitch the chunks together and then they glue the chunks that are stitched together into the book with a fabric backing on the inside of the cover. Um, but I'm, I, I thought it would be interesting since the technology is still, we have these crafts people that can still do this. And um, I mean, it's like, it, all of this is like, you know, the history thing, it's like, we're looking at we want to preserve our book making tradition right yeah and and so you go to like amazon and you buy a book for two dollars and you get it you know a printer somewhere goes and spits out your book and then it gets bound with a little bit of glue and they shove it in an envelope and send it to you in like two three days it's like a copy that was made for you in the moment because you ordered it well it's garbage you know, it's on garbage. It's, it's, I mean, it's just garbage, you know? So if you have something that's like, yeah, this is a book I want to put in my book collection. And then, you know, I'm going to be referring to this. This is a resource. This is a reference book. It isn't just the dungeon. There's stuff in here that I might want to use, or I might want to loan it to a friend so they can learn this stuff. Um, it would be nice to have this book last more than like two years of gaming. No. Well, I mean, and the, the book has a tactile feel. Like, I don't know if this comes over, but you can 
you know, mm-hmm. yeah. It, it isn't it isn't a smooth, glossy cover. You Are you know, a book smeller? You know, I used to be a book smeller, and then it I has a good smell too. Th- but then I then my then my book collection in my basement got like musty, and I stopped. Yeah. Smelling I was a book smeller till my cat peed on my copy of Lord of the Rings, and then oh oh oh, <laughs> oh no, is that the cat uh, you that too much? It was the Valentine edition, you know, with the wraparound mm-hmm. art and the oh. box, so, yeah. um. Um, anyway, yeah, I mean, we're, you know, this is, it's cool to be part of like kind of on many levels. It's like, you know, we, we started doing a movie, we're doing the history. We decide, oh, we're learning this history. Let's do a movie with this history. We're doing a book. Well, we decide to do the book and, and sort of like help maintain this, this tradition, or which is the, the book binding tradition and the book printing tradition that is going away. Um, and, and also just like keep it here in the United States, you know, and, and, and uh, sort of create an industry. And like, like I know that Bank, uh, Venger Satanis asked me about the book mm-hmm. and I gave him, we used uh, um, Egan Press here in Denver, Egan, yeah, Egan Printing, who it's a company that's been handed down in a family for a hundred years or something, you know, and they use for the binding, they do the printing for the binding they use. Denver Book Binding, which is this company that's like the last of their kind of company in like a nine state area wow. that, still, that still does this stuff, you know. Uh, I know I'm rambling on and on about this, well, but like but you said, it's like it looks like a college book that you got in like the 70s or I don't know how old you are. 70s oh, no, maybe. but for me, I, I got to college in 85 and I was a history major. And the, uh, it, you know, the other subjects were the books you got were were, were shitty books because everything was changing. But history books were the ones that, again, it had a cover that felt like that. It had a great binding, that, and it, it felt like a book was supposed to feel because it either you were going to keep it and put it onto your bookshelf, or you're going to sell it back for ten cents on the dollar. And it was going to get resold for years to come because history doesn't change. Yeah, somebody would go in there with an eraser, clean it up. Yeah, you know, before they resold it. And, yeah, pick, yeah. Out, pick out your notes that were probably wrong anyway. But yeah. Well, and the other thing is, is we have all these games we found, and um, but, you know, like I said, we're a tiny company. Like somebody, I probably shouldn't tell stories like this. I'll just do it anonymously. Somebody ordered <laughs> a, a, a DVD from us. We got like, a, you know, maybe like, I don't know, thirty DVDs left. We're not going to sell them anymore on our site. Uh, but somebody ordered one. And they were they sent Chris an email and they were like, you know, are you gonna send it yet? You know, and Chris was like, Oh, you know, I've been busy. I, I'm sorry, I've been busy, you know, and I, I hadn't sent it yet. It's like I'm running uh, other businesses, you know. And 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 they got angry and they were they were like, Oh, just cancel my order. And it's like, okay, well, you know, we'll refund your money. It's not a big deal, right? Well, it's not we're not weasels. Um, but yeah, we're kind of we're a little seat of your pants like that, you know. And maybe I shouldn't be talking about that side of it, but but, but like that, I said, we always get it done, you know. But that, that that is a reflection of the size of the company, and it's, it is, we, it you is. know. Listen, we had the guys from uh, Emperor's Choice, uh, the guys behind Ardua now that own the IP on the other week, and uh-huh. you know they had they were they're honest, you know they their company went into hiatus for a number of years. And then they had they had orders that were pending. Where they had to reach out to people. And go, hey, listen, you placed this order three years ago. Are you still interested? If you are, you know, we'll give you to it at the price that you that you ordered it to because you were never charged. Because, you know, let's be honest. Very few people in this industry, the industry is their primary source of income. This right. is usually that your your side gig. It's um, a passion. But sometimes, you know, your passion has to, you know, take a very large step back when it comes to uh, what pays the bills and uh, exactly what, what, yeah. keeps, what keeps you housed and fed. And um, oh, there's Emperor's Choice mm-hmm. game right there. There you go. We I were mean, just it, we were just plugging you guys. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. It, well, that's you know that's something. Yeah. But you know, but it, it's a two person company at, at its core and. You know, you're gonna have hiccups with that. I mean, I'm... yeah. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I had a thought and it's gone. I do that a lot. Um, um, I mean, that's the thing with all these small game companies. You know, like uh, I think that there's definitely like 
I mean, they, I guess people call it the OSR. I, um, I hate the term OSR. I like to call it traditional role playing um, or retro RPG. Um, and uh, because OSR has too many bad connotations, because there were some bad actors that produced, you know, spurious garbage. Um, but, uh, you know, the, I. I try to do the grassroots thing, like on 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 my Twitter account. Um, I'm always it, uh, somebody will like post something. I'll just see something in the scroll. It'll be some game. I don't know what it is, right? I'll just grab it. I'll retweet it, and I'll just say like, "Look, this may not be something you're into. Just um, RT it. You know, retweet it. Make a nice comment. Maybe one of your friends wants to buy this, right? And so I, I'm really like. You know, we we've got to as individuals, we're in charge of taking of taking charge of of the sort of non corporate side of the gaming and saying like, okay, you know, here's something somebody's doing. Check it out if it's something that looks like what you want. Um, there's the whole. I don't care about additional war because I'm not interested in the corporate D and D because it is not D and D to me right. because it is not produced by TSR, the original TSR. And it doesn't have Dave and Gary's name on it. It's been sold on and is it is a commodity. It is a product. It's an Adidas shoe. It is a Taco Bell. I don't care. I play my old games. But I do look at stuff by people that I think are doing interesting stuff that just weird, weird ideas for games where I'm like, I want that, you know, and I'm and I'm also gonna go out of my way to let everybody else know that maybe they should get a copy too. Um I think that there's a lot of talk in the in the uh, in the game community. I mean, like you were just talking about these em the, the Emperor's Choice games, yep. you know, like you're doing what I like to do. It's like you talk about these people that are doing cool stuff and sort of supporting the tradition of the traditional role playing. And um, um, I think it's important to be very grassroots. I mean, that's how D and D started. It was a grassroots. You got to. I played this thing. You got to check it out. You know, come over. We're gonna play it, and then you know, go out, get a copy of for yourself. That's how TSR was born was through a great, like a, a grassroots support. Um, one person, you know, face to face. I saw this thing. You, you got to see it, you know? And so, um, yeah, I keep trying to do that with stuff. Like I had a guy that sent me this thing. It was a, it was a five E module. It's in Spanish. It was published in Spain and it's like this big box, you know? And, um, I haven't really had a time to look at it. I don't speak Spanish. I speak Italian, so it's hard for me to read it. It looks beautiful, though, and so I'm going to try to take some pictures of that and put it maybe on my blog, maybe tweet some images on my Twitter, put some images on, uh, I don't know, maybe drop a couple images on Reddit, a couple images on, on the Facebook page. Um, just say, like, you know, these people did this thing. It is super high quality. They probably sold... 300 copies they're not going to make a living off of this right but you know if you want a spanish language uh D, D supplement you know go for it it's great you know it's it's cool it's got maps it's got lore it's got everything um sorry i gotta do that speech i always want to do the speech for like the little guys <laughs> um, that's what mike and i do we are the little, yeah we're the little guys too so yeah i get we got you and I mean, well, the, the whole point of the Wednesday night live streams, especially with Mike and I, is generally to have guests on from the industry so we can talk about stuff that people might not normally think right. about or, or be, you know, be, be thinking about. Yeah. yeah. It's important. It is, you know. Um, well, you know, it was like that. I remember when I first, I have a first edition ogre somewhere in the house, um, unless it got thrown out accidentally, which would make me weep. But, you know, it's still it's astounding to think about little companies also like uh, Flying Buffalo and metagaming, you know, with Tunnels and Trolls and metagaming with Melee Wizard and Ogre and GV. Um, you'd go into the, the game store and there were these little games in a little plastic sealed envelope that were two ninety. I think it was two ninety five for the whole. I mean, you got a whole game for three bucks, you know which might be like 10 bucks now or something like that. It's still, it was so cheap, you know, ridiculous. It was, yeah, it was just stupid and expensive. And um, I sort of look for stuff like that. I, it's hard to there. Now there are so many games out there that it's hard to figure out what's a good one and worth exploring. You know, um, I, I'm sort I, of overwhelmed. I have so many games. It becomes, 
if I buy another game that takes up too much space, is Rach, my wife, going to now buy perfume to match my investment? And oh, yeah. And it's, and, it, and it's like a brinksmanship. It's like, all right, I don't want to get... I, I want to get smaller stuff so it doesn't necessarily show up on a shelf. And she goes, oh, what's this box? Oh, well, that looks cool. I guess I need another <laughs> high-priced perfume. But yeah, like, uh, it sounds like a nice arrangement. Uh, it, yeah. She's happy with it, but I'm not sure if I am. Uh, yeah, we have a small house, so mm. uh, Sarah's collecting of, of like fine experimental literature <laughs> is a little bit limited by bookshelves. And my game okay. collecting, I mean, I, I sold in 2008 when everybody got disemployed because of the whole collapse or whatever. Right. Um, I had to sell, I basically sold my game collection and had I, and just sat in my house and I'd have like one meal a day because I was on unemployment and couldn't afford mm -hmm. to eat. I could only afford to pay my house payment, you know. Right. But I sold my entire game collection except for maybe five things, you know. Um, um, Divine Right being one of them. Great little war game, board game. Um, he's going to go get his copy. He's going to yeah. go get it. I see him. Uh, Marcel, Divine Right. What's that? Marcelo wants to know what the name of the spell, uh, the Spanish product is that you were talking about. Well, hang See, dead air. All right, I'll be back. Griff, I was just, I'm just looking at my copy. Today. Game. I'll be right back. I was just looking at my copy today. Divine right. See, I never had divine right. Oh, I never check owned. this out. It's in shrink. See, my, I found my, it. My I, I have like three. I have like three copies because you know I always open up shrink. Well, I have three copies, so. So, okay. So the story about this is it used to belong to Gary Gygax. When right. Gary, he started, he, he saw in the nineties, he started auctioning a lot of his stuff off. He had a case of these six of them in his basement. Frank Mentor and I bid against each other. He had this auction off eBay, and we bid against each other, and and we both got a high bid, so we just split the box. So I, I, got I each this, got three copies. The Spanish of game, yeah. I got to get a hold of this guy. He was so nice. He was like. You know, he was just like, oh, I just want to, I saw the movie. I love the movie. I just want to show you what we're working on over here. You know, and I get a kick out of that. I get contacted by people like, um, I have two guys, Marcin, uh, Marcin Sedget, and uh, what's the other guy's name? He has all these weird accounts. Uh, Bogdan, I think is his first name, in Poland, you know, and they're like hardcore, like OD&D, &D, AD D players in Poland. And uh, they're always keeping me apprised of what's going on there. And uh, yeah, I like to talk to people all over the planet that are doing like their, you know, their version. It's called Arth. Oh, interesting. Um, it looks nice. Yeah, I got, well, there's the light. I have to kind of turn, I only have one light now. No, it's but, okay. I mean, this is, this is chunky. Yeah. Right? It's got this shiny, uh, like the print, the print is shiny and the cover is matte. It's kind of a cool thing where this like person's face is actually like shiny on it. Um, yeah, I mean, since you wanted to talk about just random game stuff, I mean, the thing is just, you know, this is one of those, like you, you showed me that you, you, I see you do the, the show like games that you get that are off mm -hmm. Kickstarters. This thing is huge. I mean, here's the, you know, here's the first book. Multiple divine rights. Thank you, Mike. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, no, gotta, I love like, this game. I love divine rights. Isn't it fun? Yeah. Uh, I, love, I have yes. some friends that we've been playing for decades and we get together. One, like my buddy lives in, in uh, Toulouse, France. And so when he comes to visit, you know, I'll, I'll get it out. It's hard to find enough people. To, I can never find enough people to play it. That's that's the one one problem I have with it. But yeah, it's Look at this oh, character I, I sheets. These, these are pre-gen yeah. character sheets. A big stack of that. Um, oh, the maps, the maps. See, we're like doing a freebie. I got to get a hold of this guy until I'm like, we did a freebie pitch for your your Here art thing. Um, there's a whole dungeon Actually, complex. A half. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, here's a world setting type thing, I guess. You know, like I see these Kickstarters and what you get is like just garbage, right? You are, there isn't a lot of stuff. It's weird because it's sort of like, it looks like it's sort of this sci-fi, which I'm down with. The, 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 you mix fantasy and sci-fi in a world setting and I'm totally there. Oh, here's the letter. What is Gabriel? He just wrote me this really nice letter. It was just like, I love the movie. I really appreciate, you know, your and what you did. Here's another book, right? Um, we're not done yet. Like this thing is amazing. And I can't read it because it's in Spanish. I can just kind of skim it. Here's another book. 
And I might have stolen the dice out of it. No, it didn't come with dice. Here's another book. Um, here's another book. That's a huge box. Damn. I mean, this is okay. One, two, three. Yeah, these. You know, he put. Oh, maybe his name is in his game. Las ruinas de Oreth. Las ruinas. Gabriel Gonzalez Dijo. Oh, it's Gabriel Dijo. I know who that is. Um, I, you know, you you know people on the internet, and you don't have like that connection of the face right. and the name and the and uh, and then I don't know what the the game company is. Sugar, Sugar Editorial. But I got uh, three booklets. This, uh, yeah, it's astounding. Two maps. Three. Uh, no, three maps. Three maps. Uh, giant stack of character sheets. I mean, there's 20 sheets here. I'm assuming they're character sheets. I haven't looked through it. Yeah, they're all character sheets, pre-gens. Oh, there's lore in here. Check this out. I, You know, it's one of those things where you get it and you're just busy and you don't have time to look at it all. Um, this is some sort of lore thing that has to do with the story that you might hand out to your, your characters. Oh, I, I love handouts. Yeah, I do a lot of handouts in my games. Yeah, there's art, weird art, like ancient art that you found inside the tomb complex or whatever, or what you think is a tomb complex, but might be, I don't know, somebody's space pod. Um, <laughs> massive. That, that. There's got to be 20 sheets there. Of wow. Good card. You know, it's not printed on cheap crap. Right. So what did we do? We did uh, one, two, three, four, four books and five books, six books. Look at that. That's astounding. But yeah, that's the kind of stuff like people send me stuff and I'm just like, um, that's cool. So that's where I was going with, I sold my collection in 2008. Mm -hmm. I kept like five games, my, my original D and D books and supplements, um, divine right. Um, somewhere there's a thing of micro games cause they don't take up a lot of space. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that might be it. My monster man, my first edition monster man. Um, and then when we started doing the movie, people started giving us game stuff. And so like, uh, especially, uh, John Snyder, he's just like, I, I don't game anymore. You know, I'm, I'm like 70 years old. I don't need to worry about this stuff. So he gave us basically double what my original collection was in like all this, all this old gaming stuff. And he was like, I got it for free. Dave Arneson would, I was in the army and Dave Arne in 76 and Dave Arneson would just send me games because he was getting them from the companies, uh, you know? Mm -hmm. So I have like, uh, you know, like a, like a city state of the invincible overlord original, you know, and like first fantasy campaign is in there somewhere. And, um, I think I might even have pieces of the, uh, the Dave Arneson and, and, and Richard Snyder fantasy game that they did together. Um, Oof, Adventures in fantasy. Yeah. Adventures in fantasy. Um, anyway. Yeah. Isn't this cool though? Like it is, you know, I, I would like to get on um, zoom with, with uh, Gabriel Dijo and just have him like run me through a game on zoom sometime, you know, and maybe get a couple other gamers together and just be like, just, you know, you know, this setting, you created it. Right. I want to play it with you. I don't want to run it. I want to like get in your head and, and go into this, crazy place that you've created um yeah and i guess it's for 5e so this is uh you know this would be maybe my first adventure into 5e would be i'd be willing to do it with this spanish edition of 5e hmm. um so now um ty beard uh t texas lawyer uh says he was watching us left us and started watching the blackmore documentary so real time <laughs> Real time <laughs> review, he says, beyond awesome. But he does have a question. He wants to know, did you narrate? Yeah, yeah. We wanted to get somebody famous, you know, and uh, but we don't have any money, you know. It's that. What is it? If, is it is it uh, Homer Simpson that said like a, a caviar taste and a pizza face? Was that Homer? Um, <laughs> Could be. That's what we. Yeah. So I, I invented. I I. Um, just kind of created a voice like the voice is is affected you know um but i wanted i did a lot of work to create the voice for the movie because i wanted 
it to sound uh, like you watch a lot of stuff and people are shouting, like, like they're doing the sports announcer, announcer thing, like, welcome back. We're going to do all kinds of exciting stuff. And I wanted it to sound like a very close thing. And so I, I spoke very softly and, and I got very close to the microphone and I said, this is, this is the Blackmore Bunch, a group of players you know, that have been playing Dungeons and Dragons since before Dungeons and Dragons was created. And um, my sister had studied hypnosis. And so I, I used a little bit of her hypnosis technique on my pacing, <laughs> which maybe makes parts of it a little slow and people might fall asleep in parts of it. But um, um, the only, you know, my biggest regret, like I like the voice I created it my, with it. My biggest regret is that uh, when we got to the end of the movie, I was loading the movie in my head, the whole thing. So you got over two hours of stuff that I'm trying to keep in my, like organized in my head to know where everything is. And, um, um, and I'm, I felt like I was under all this pressure to complete it because I just wanted, you know, I wanted to get it done. Um, and so I only did like three takes on every voiceover. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, we got together with Dan and our buddy at his house and he's a, he's a sound guy. And, uh, um, um, yeah, I just did like, I mean, maybe there's like five on some, but for the most part, it's just like. It took like two or three days to get it all down. And it was just like, boom, 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 you know. And um, my sister was there producing it for me because she used to do TV too. So she was like um, kind of being my producer and telling me to try different things. But when I went to edit it, I was just had such a mass of footage there too, on top of the like 200 hours of interviews that I've seen that um, I regret that certain places it's maybe not as lively as it should be or you know, it's, it's just, it is what it is. Like it's a low budget documentary, you know, it, most it doesn't feel low budget. That's the thing. It, it really, it, it has a, a really solid high end, uh, you know, feel to it. And, and, and by the way, uh, Emperor's choice says that you may uh, need some auto and pro products, larger documentary. I, I, I will connect the two of you offline. Oh yeah, I'd love. I'm a, you know, I, I was, uh, I remember the first time I saw the Arduin Grimoire book, the first book, and it was just like, ooh, this is weird. We were all into the critical hits table. We were like, that was awesome, you know, because D and D, O D and D didn't have critical hits at all, you know. So it's like a whole new thing. Um, what else can we talk about? I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just like, you know, I'm doing game stuff. I think. Maybe the big thing is just like, I'm just a gamer like you, like I just want to game, you know. Um, I don't get to game as much as I'd like. Uh, I think I, a few I, of us do in our adult lives, you know, that's part of- Yeah, it's just hard to get together with people and, and get gaming. And also I, I kind of want like a really high quality experience of, of, of gaming with an RPG that maybe it's hard to find a good DM that can create like a kind of background lore and stuff. Like what I put in my own RPGs when I run them, um, I put a lot of lore and stuff in there. So you're not just finding treasure, you're finding clues, you know. It's the mystery of it, the uncovering the truth of what's going on. Um, and so I do stuff like I have a blog, I, I write a lot of like OD and D stuff there. I just recently posted a, a sort of a prototype for a character class based on the character in the movie Stalker by Tarkovsky. Um, uh, if you've ever watched Stalker, it's like the ultimate sort of like combo dungeon and wilderness adventure without monsters and just creepy weirdness. Um, um, but uh, and then I just recently like I did, a, I'm building a, my own tarot deck for Blackmore so that I can do like character. I can do actual like tarot readings for people's characters inside the game. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's really cool. It's like the book, the, the, the divination cards. Like I have a whole thing. It's like you lay down a silk piece of paper. Like I, I do these things where you were talking about props, like handouts, you know? Right. So I want to, when my players sit down and we're playing and they, they, they somehow end up at some soothsayer's place, I lay down a silk uh, um, kerchief, you know, but I like a diamond pointing between me and the player that's getting their reading. And then a feather gets laid in the middle and then a stone on one side or the, st the feather goes on one side and the stone goes on the other. And then they draw the cards for the feather and the stone. And I read their, their characters prophecy. And, um, 
yeah and that's kind of tied in with that that uh, uh seeker class that i was writing for the like i had this epiphany i wanted to do i wanted to make my fantasy D D a little bit more kind of supernatural but in, in a kind of donnie darko sort of way you know if you've seen that film like just kind of mysterious and weird like he's that that mood that vibe you know um but yeah i don't know what else can we talk about i mean uh, I, uh, john john miller wants to know where your blog is uh secrets of blackmore.com oh it's a link link uh all right well, yeah there you I, go. I got hey. i write a lot of stuff on there um sometimes i did write something a little bit bombastic on there a little while ago about uh D D is sort of like a, a drug and how 5e is like the ultimately crafted drug to, to like it's like crack cocaine of dnds of rpgs and um but uh, i do a lot of stuff like i had come up with this uh when i after i played pathfinder i was like i like the d20 system i'm going to use the d20 system but there are too many rules i'm not going to use the feats and all that stuff and we're not going to and, and i ran this campaign that was it took place my players didn't know where they were they wake up but they're in these like globes and there's lights coming through and they're all naked and they have to get out of these globes like each one of us in, in their own and they they don't know that they're actually giant spiders and then they're on a, a place that's this giant space station kind of like metamorphosis alpha so i did this sort of combo of metamorphosis alpha and uh, empire of the pedal throne tecumel thing on this spaceship thing that we played for a while and then um um, so I made my own rules for it. I just, and I, I was like, I don't need any rules to run an RPG. I just, I just need to know, like, if you want to try to do something, what you need to roll, right? And um, I learned a lot, actually, designing my own, ex, ex, you know, uh, uh, system. When you design your own system, you really, um, you see the flaws really easily. And, and uh, like, the, too much success is not good. Too little success isn't good. Um, if you look at D&D, &D, like, the minimum hit roll is a 50%, right, on, on OD&D. &D. And, um, and that's because players, you know, they, they, if you get to them on their, like, fourth try and they still haven't hit anything, you know, the mm -hmm. game isn't fun. Um, but um, um, what else was I going to say about that? I don't know. That was just a fun campaign to run. And I wanted to do, like, kind of take it further. And so they met this princess that was a giant spider princess and one of the guys she took a fancy to him and they go he went back to the city with them the other guys went off somewhere they ended up in a marsh and found a a, a subway tunnel and they they met a dragon which is actually a robot that sent them on a quest to find magic stuff which was really radioactive material that needed a source so it could no longer be tethered as a robot it needed power but um um what happened was I, I got them into the situation where then I had the guys that were away became one side and the guy that was with the princess became the other. And I took the old chainmail games and I was like, they were on a milit he was on a military ex expedition with the princess and they get ambushed. And I, we got out all the miniatures to play the battle. And um, the player didn't really like being like isolated alone against the rest of the party and kind of threw a tantrum over it because he was getting really beat up by the party. And I mean, it was, and I don't know, it, like I try to expand the level at which you're being, your play is happening. You know, you're not just a meathead in a dungeon. Now you're, you're the princess's consort and you're leading an army um, for the princess in a, in a matriarchal society where you're like a second citizen, you're allowed to lead the army. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. That's like, that's why what is what I was talking about, like finding somebody to game with. It's like I want to right. game in a game where I can do weird stuff, right? Well, and, and that's just it too. You got to find the right group that that fits you and your style of play, and that's that's always been rough. I mean, in a way, it's it's easier and harder because of the internet. You have right. a greater a greater a player base that you can fall mm -hmm. back upon, but at the same time, that also means that. You got a random, it's like it's like a random generated party. You may have people that you're compatible with, and you may have people that you aren't. I mean, uh, the the group that I have steadily gained with off and on over years are people that I've gotten to know over the years through blogging, through right. videos and podcasts. We have a similar sense of uh, humor. Uh, it it 
you know, similar things. And they're all they're all basically game designers to some extent. So I I always feel I'm out class when it comes to uh, you know, right uh, <laughs> gameplay, but it does bring out the better challenge. Not just as you as a game master when I GM for these people, when, I'm, when I am a player because everybody here we rotate. Everybody takes four to six weeks and runs a runs a game, runs a system. All right, now we're going on to see. Lobby. That's the thing you rotate. Yeah, that's really good actually. Yeah. That's that's like the old days, you know. It's like so and so is going to run Traveler today. So and so is going to do Tunnels of Trolls this day. This guy's going to do whatever Chivalry and Sorcery this day. Yeah, I'd like to. Well, like Banger, I don't. I don't know if he's. he's no, still in, still, but... but, uh, yeah, I, I need to get online with him and play a little bit with him and his Gonzo, one of his Gonzo games, because uh, it's it's the other direction of what I like would be like just some something over the top, you know. Gonzo like that. Yeah, I, I th it, it all has a place, and I think for many of us, we can all fit into it as long as we know going into it what we're going to expect. I mean, if you know going into the session you're going to be playing Gonzo, then you're ready for Gonzo. If you go into it, think you're going to play something standard, mm. and then they turn it into Gonzo, that's when some of your players might, you know, rebel or have an issue or because it's not what they expected. I never liked right. I never. There, there, there are surprises that you can throw uh, on your players, but um, game style is never mm -hmm. one of them. You can, right, right. You, you can throw surprises in during a campaign or during a game session, but you don't surprise them as to how the session is going to be played. Right. You can't do the at the Woody Woodpecker where suddenly the guy pulls the giant battle axe from behind his back and chops everybody up. Or whatever. <laughs> no, like no. You got to see the you got to see the battle axe first and you right. know, unless you're playing if you're going to run or not. Right. Know? Unless you're playing tune. In which case it kind tune of Tune would it would work in tune, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, my thing. Tune isn't my thing. You know what I recently bought actually speaking of old kind of Gonzo games. I was in a game store in Illinois and they had old copies of uh Paranoia. Mm. Oh, I play tested some adventures for West End Games back. Really? Then. Yeah, they were in Manhattan. And um, um, I you know I just snapped. It. I mean, it was like, like nobody knows what it is anymore, so it was like really cheap, you know. And uh, so I just snapped it up, and it was one of the games that all the guys played. Seems like I missed like I almost never missed the game sessions, and the times I missed was when they played Paranoia, and oh. then I would hear about it. They'd be like, "Oh my God, we played this amazing game." And then I and then they never played it with me, so I never got to play it. So I'm sort of a, uh, I like I talk about it like I know what I'm talking about, but I just bought it, and I'm sort yeah. of like, I'd rather find a good DM for it that would run me through it, that knows it, than just have to DM my group. Yeah, see, see now that reminds me, Mike. If you remind me, maybe I'll bring it in for uh, midnight auction. I believe I have the uh, Hill Sector Blues playtest. Uh, no oh time. yeah, you always tell me about that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, well, I can donate them. You know, we have a uh, North Texas has a pretty good um, paranoia showing because Ben Burns runs the game every year. Okay, and I th I, we we usually have at least one game a year. Paranoia, paranoia is a that's that's a fun game. You know, yeah, it's funny. No, I live in them. in Denver, and I I um, Kostikian I think did paranoia. Was it, it was Kostikian? Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. Kostikian. Yeah. He's an astounding game designer, and um, <clears throat> I'm I uh, looked him up, and I was like, wait a minute, this guy lives in Boulder. He's like. 30 miles from me, you know, and he, we used to play, um, there was a game he made called uh, Pax Britannica, which was oh, a, yeah. uh, it was a beautiful game, double, double SPI size maps that you'd put like this. And instead of the earth being like the, the poles are here, you have the North mm -hmm. pole is in the middle. So you have like the players. So everybody sits by their country and their country is face up to them. And, and it's a, uh, Pre World War One colonialist global expansion, very politically. War gaming is great because historical war gaming is like, hey, we're just doing a simulation of what happened, right? We're safe. Um, but um, I didn't. Uh, so yeah, he designed that. We used to play that. I played that several times, and it was. I regret selling my copy because it's probably one of the most astounding games. But it takes like two six-hour sessions, seven players. You're writing treaties. You yeah, know, it's it's, it's modern modern gaming doesn't seem to have the patience for a lot of that stuff. I mean, what we what we could do when we gamed uh, eight hours at a shot, you could. I mean, 
Yeah. I remember playing uh, uh, Risk over the course of a weekend with about, I think, 13 hours between uh, the two sessions because you could leave it out on the table and then come back to it the next day and you went you went back to it i don't did know. you do that the um endless universe risk where you get like three sets and put them end to end no 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 oh my god that and that that takes like a week you know no i we were so much into risk though that i actually uh, had taken tracing paper and traced out the map so we could have a portable map if we were going to take it to somebody else's house so we could put the traced out map and just bring the uh just bring uh, your little yeah, my my set had the caltrops, so right. so I, yeah, I didn't have the one with the Roman numerals. I had the caltrops. I had the that caltrops always, too. Yeah, that was always coming to you. I had like an eight, like I think a like a late seventies edition one. Yeah, I think that's probably when mine was late seventies, early eighties. Um, you know, or, or you know, you could always do like a, a the Gondwala Land version where you take the old you know Pan Pangea <laughs> map. <laughs> And we never drew our own maps. I, 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 I traced it, and we traced it out. We're, like, well, we're going to play at so and so's house. Just don't bring the whole box. Just you know, you had the traced out map, and you brought the counters, and then then my other friends like, like oh, they they bought their own copies of Risk, so we could do it at somebody else's house. But right, that was the, that was the go to when you didn't have your full quorum of players for an RPG session. Somebody couldn't make it. You still wanted the game, but you weren't going to move the campaign along without everybody. You know, one of the things, oh, I was just back to the movie stuff just briefly. One of the people we interviewed, and, and the interview wasn't that great because he was just like, he was bigger than life, was, um, um, what the hell was his name? Three, the, the, the dice, the, uh, the miniatures maker, Uncle Duke. Oh, yeah, it was the Duke Siegfried. Uh, Siegfried, the, right? Yeah, yeah, and that was really cool to be in his, like this... The, that's the thing that you don't see in the movie that um, I wish we would have gotten more B-roll of stuff. Um, we went to Siegfried's, Siegfried's place and he had this little room off his basement and um, I go in the room and it's all shelves and there it's just box after box that's about this big that's about this tall with painted armies in them. We're talking a room oh with like a thousand painted miniature armies in it. <laughs> and then um, he... He um, sat down on his workbench while we were taking a break, and he asked me if he knew if I knew anything about how miniatures were made. And I, you know, I know a little bit, but he was like, "Oh, well, there there are also these kick techniques." And he and he showed me. He sat there and with a soldering iron and lead, just by adding lead and solder, he started to sculpt a miniature in lead with solder and a soldering iron. Wow. And, yeah, I was just, I have a, I, unfortunately, it's not a really good, it's like a phone shot, you know, but he did that technique. He was talking about, there's the drawing technique where you draw out the lead with the heat. And then I forgot the other one was, uh, there was another tech, there were two techniques for like literally sculpting right in lead instead of casting, you know, but um, um, there was some, that, there was another guy who his whole basement was a game collection and I see game collections on the internet. People post pictures. This was a maze. It was like a dungeon maze of bookshelves. And oh. Everything was a game up in the Twin Cities. Um, yeah, just weird things like that. We didn't really have any need to use that footage in the, in the movie, in the first movie. Right. But um, he was actually one of the guys um, who did, he was one of the dungeon masters who did what is, is known as Minstuff Dungeon which was when Dave Arneson did a demonstration of Dungeons and Dragons at the science, at uh, I think it was the University of Minnesota, a bunch of sci-fi fans showed up from the sci-fi community and watched. And um, this guy, Blue Petal, went home after watching that and he invented his own D&D game based solely on having watched a Blackmore session and would run dungeons using his own rules that he had he'd created. And so... Uh, um, um, yeah, there was a whole dungeon adventuring culture within the sci-fi community that was a set of rules that was just word of mouth. They would just play, and, and they didn't have any rules, and they would just roll dice and stuff, and it was just like maybe a little bit more gonzo because it was sci-fi fans who right. you know, it was like a mixture. But yeah, like there are all these spin-offs like that. Once the idea gets out, you know, Tunnels right, and Trolls well, comes out. That's pretty much the history of like Tunnels and Trolls, which... 
you know, it was Ken San Andre seeing uh, playing a, day, a session of D and D, saying I can't afford these rules, but remembering enough of the gameplay to figure out how to kind of rewrite them, but not having polyhedral dice, only D sixes, and you know. well, and it was interesting that he came up with a dice pool system. Yes. You know, like they did a total different thing. And I think people didn't really understand because it's 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 more abstracted than the D&D, like roll the hit concept and damage. Um, I think people didn't grasp that it was still playable. You know, it didn't it didn't make sense. Like you just roll dice and total them and that's your hit, you know. Um, so maybe that was why it didn't get as popular. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I'm always... I always wonder because it was it was a much more complete game system than the original D and D system, you know. And they, I think it, it was a point system for Magic, right? Um, yes. Yeah. It was, it was a point. It was it was a spell point system for Magic, and I mean, it, you can you can see like the, the different editions. I I I have a reprint of the first. I have Ken signed copy of his play. Uh, his play copy from second edition. I uh, I have I don't have third, but it looks to be identical to, to second, as far as I can tell. And they got fourth, fifth, five E, the British versions. But there's so many variants on TNT as the years went on, and, and right. people got you know, the rights to license it overseas. Um, it's just uh, as a person who's a collector by nature, I needed something I could collect that was right. finite. And right. it wasn't, wasn't going to make me go broke. I, well, then you got all the solos, right? And that's more trouble. Oh, and personally, if you go from the early uh, printings of the solos, when they were literally just stapled together with just one side of the paper having, you know, the you know, back side right. of the paper is blank, you know. Then a little, that, that grippy ring spiral binder. Thing. So that, that was later. Yeah, I got some it's of those. Pages. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Some of those are amazing. Um, Sword for Hire, I think, was just a phenomenal. Story. There was just, there was some really, really good stuff. And it, it it just shows you, like, a divergence in the evolution of of role-playing games. And you see that with, with yeah. Dave's stuff and Dave's group and the divergence that was going on. And even once... D and D came out, and we, we could do a whole other episode on this. But the yeah, whole, yeah, yeah. you know, the West Coast and the Midwest, and then the official versions of D and D. This is how uh, the Ardo and Grimoire came into play, and all this stuff is yeah, it's fantastic you know, concept. And um, it, it's like anything else in science, right? Evolution diverges, and it doesn't mean that either version is. Uh, less right but sometimes yeah, hey all right well the one that did best might not be the best it's just the one that was in the right place at the right time had the right support. yeah yeah i mean again, that, well it's a whole other hey hey story. guys I, I'm, I'm gonna have to bow out my grandson's on spring break he just texted me and said you're supposed to be home at nine o'clock it's 9 20. Right. i was about to say we're going a little <laughs> long i was just about so, to ask you some stuff i didn't know if you'd seen the movie yet mike or if you I have it. I, I have it on my rental, though. I, I've rented it. I've got to watch it before the end of the month. Well, Tenkar so, and I will just finish up, and, and we can let you go. Okay, yeah, you, for, you guys do. You guys keep going. I don't, I don't want to you, harsh your buzz. I want to yeah. come to your convention sometime. Oh, great. It's a pleasure to meet you, Griff. And um, yeah. I, will, I will see everybody next week. But, yeah, I got I, the grandsons. They get to be about 18. Nice. You're just happy when they want to spend time with you. So oh, I'll take it, Mike. Take, <laughs> right, take, take it. You have a few years where they want nothing to do with you. I yeah, know. pretty. That's coming. That's, that day's coming. Yeah, later. We won't later, go guys. there about my kid. Yep. Um, all right, ciao, man. Um, no, it's really nice to be able to talk to you, Tenkar. I mean, we kind of ramble, and you know, it's been all over the place this but evening. But um, listen, like, well, I told you as we were getting in the pre-show. Uh, yeah. Know, my 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 friend Joe, who I do this every other week on a Friday, he's like he calls it the green room before and after. But the pre-show, we mentioned, and I said like, this should be. Relaxing. This should be like right, just have a good time. Pub, having yeah. a conversation. And you might be having a conversation with somebody who's quote a stranger, right. but you are at the same time intimate or conversant because you're talking about topics that you all enjoy. And and I, I said it before and I'll say it again. The audience, uh the live stream uh I've been I, I have the comments up so I can kind of look at the comments every once in a while and see. You know what's going on with with you know the people that are in the side 
sidebar. Um, but um, yeah, no, it's just good to finally, uh, you know, talk to you in person and yeah. uh, um, talk about all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. It's funny because like people see the movie and that there's so much stuff like we did so much work, you know, and I have so many stories and I often tell the same story on every, I try to tell different stories, but there are certain stories that just stick out in my mind from when we were making the movie. But um, um, we have just so much footage and so much interesting, uh, like the DVD has a lot of bonus footage with Ross Maker in particular. And Ross is interesting because he's a very, he, he's a slow speaker because he's really thinks about what he's going to say. Okay. Right? And so you've got to like, I'm a, I, I'm a chatterbox. You're kind of like that, you know, New Yorker. I mean, you're going to, yeah. right. Um, you never, can um, never say enough. There's never, right. We thing. only have a finite amount of time, so we better talk fast. But um, <laughs> that was one of the things that related to just as a last thing, um, the bonus DVD stuff where Ross talks about the stuff they did that is surprising. Like the, one of the house rules was if your character bought the farm, then you'd play the monsters, you know? And uh, that way you didn't have to leave the game session. Like now you'd run into a band of orcs and now Tankar's, you know, his thief got wasted. So now he's going to be the orcs and he's going to try to kill us, you know? And um, he talked about a lot of like little rules like that, which I think are really interesting. It's like, that's, that's the sort of stuff that I think uh, I'd like to put in the next movie is, is, the stuff that you can apply to your own game, these ideas right. that like can help you. Like I did that. I had a session where somebody died and it was the party. They were like, well, why don't we have them play as mule? And so the, the character became the mule, you know? Yeah. We've, um, we've done stuff like that and we've done it uh, either with, uh, all right, well, the NPC that you were interacting with, who was kind of like not really going to be big thing. Well, they can now, you know, be part of it. Or right. I, or I've I've done it too. It's like all right, uh, it, it depends on the player. If you if you know the player will get into the role, having them play the uh, the big bad evil guy, right. and let them role play it out and kind of be hands off on that works. Some people don't want to do that. Some people are like ah oh, no, no no I don't want to. Yeah, they don't or, like the competitive aspect. Right. Of it. And some yeah. people just yeah. jump and they, they they chomp at the bit for the opportunity. Well, who doesn't want to be evil at least once, right? Well, again, you have to know it, it, what might work um, in an established home group because you know your players and you you know the personalities may not work at a convention because you don't necessarily know the players at a convention. So it's like, oh, hey, I'm going to throw you into the role of playing uh, the big bad Barsh over here. And like, oh, I, I don't, I don't want to have to kill my fellow players. Right, and you know, yeah. it, 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 okay. it, 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 the, the dynamics, and again, I'm sure we could do a, a whole episode on uh, the different dynamics between a convention play or pickup games mm -hmm. and the dynamics of an established group. You can get away with a lot more in your established group because the expectations that they have of you and you have of them are already established to a large extent, whereas with a convention group or a pickup group, you almost have to aim for the lowest common denominator and then slowly adjust it as you see right. where the group is. It's it's, it's a different. I've done both. Um, I enjoy I'm, doing both. But I'm going to be running uh, Tonisborg at GaryCon. I don't know if anybody in the uh, in the audience is going to GaryCon, but I've got some slots open in the movie screening, and I'm running. Uh, I think my my the Battle in the Skies game, that D and D aerial combat game, is already full. But I need somebody to play a naval game with me. I got these big lead ships, and we're going to blow each other up with uh, Fletcher Pratt rules. Um, but um, but no, talking about that, it is different. Like at a convention, you sort of feel like you're doing a show, yeah, and you can't kill somebody right away. So I'm I'm uh, I'm I don't know. I'm gonna I don't know how I'm going to handle that because I just want to give them the real experience. And so I don't. And it's like it's, I, I got you know the awful. kid for thing where you want to be nice at the beginning of the adventure and get more and more brutal and it's like i may just off somebody right from the very beginning i don't know yeah see like my my unofficial and it's not written in stone but usually when i'm running a game or at least in the past if i've been running a game i've been running it under the auspices for frog guy games because i work at the table and running the games for the company 
So people are at a convention. They're, they're paying for the experience of playing in an RPG session because they like the setting, they like the company, they like right. the game system, whatever. But there's an expectation that they paid their fee. Right. There's a certain return on investment. So my my unofficial theory has always been, and this is rough because I usually was running things for like first and second level characters, is we always had a break mid-session. So a four-hour game at the two-hour mark. I always give the, the bathroom break, smoke break, take 15, come back. Yeah, I do like 50 minutes, 10 minute break. Yeah. And then minutes, 10 I try, I, I, I really don't want to, if, unless the dice are really evil, I don't, I'm not looking to kill any players. Oh, sorry, PCs, not players. I don't want to kill any PCs before that break, but after the break, they've already had a half session. They've already had a chance. Right. To now the lethality, now can, and I'm not going to announce it, now the lethality is up. No, now it becomes. Yeah, we're playing for keeps. Part, yeah, you know now now we're going to be a little bit more uh, uh, dirty DM. <clears throat> I kind of I, I I mean I don't have a lot of time before the convention to prepare things, but I almost feel like I need to prepare like two Thomas like I survived Thomasburg and I died in Tom, <laughs> Thomasburg, like little little uh, forms that I fill out. But I also thought about I still have all of my old dragon magazines, and I was almost thinking of just bringing the dragons along and, and as people die, I'll just give them like an old like seventies era copy of the dragon to take home or something. Hey. Cause I don't need it. You know, I read them a million times, you know, right. And I'm getting rid of stuff. There was a question in the sidebar about the egg of coot controversy. Yes. Um, uh, what exactly about the egg of coot controversy though? Well, I, is I guess it... is does the egg of coot uh, refer to E. Gary Gygax. No, no, it was great. It was Greg. Uh, uh, it's Greg Scott, GHQ, who's in the movie also. Um, Dave Arneson and Greg Scott had a huge um, sort of rivalry between them. I think Greg didn't really like Arneson. Um, and I can understand that because I've, you know, I've gotten, I feel like I know Arneson on a personal level because I've read so much of his work. Um, like, you know, you don't, we saw so, you, you don't know. The, the, the scope of like the, 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 the collections that we looked at of Arneson and stuff. Like there were two that would be like a uh, 12 foot long wall covered with boxes full of just stuff from his life. Really? Like one, one of them has his like boy scout uniform in it, you know? Um, and uh, um, Greg Scott just, he and Arneson just didn't get along. And I think part of it was Arneson was kind of, I mean, Arneson was kind of a fat, nerdy kid, you know. He wasn't that socially adept when he was younger, I don't think. And um, um, and Scott just picked on him a lot, you know. He would tease him and and, and taunt him. And, um, yeah, and so uh, the first corner of the table issue talks, Arneson talks about the collapse of the campaign, and he talks about how the players are, you know, everybody thinks they're winning and things just fell apart in this big campaign the Napoleonic campaign. And I think that might be, that's the last instance that you, that Greg Scott is playing with Arneson. Then he mentions Greg Scott and they're sort of, they, they, they're in orbit around each other in the community there, but they aren't really friends, you know? Right. Um, I mean, I don't think they hated, hated each other. Um, Scott and his wife got to know Wesley's parents really well and would go on like canoeing trips with Wesley's parents because they were a little older. Um, so, yeah, the whole uh, the egg of coot thing, I mean, they just, yeah, it's Greg Scott, you know. And the reason you can support that is because if you look at the FSC, the next character that's described is the Ron of Afu. And when Greg Scott split away at that time, Randy Hoffa, who was at that time working at GHQ Miniatures and hadn't started um, um, his own company, uh, CNC Miniatures, uh, went off with that group of players and joined that group. So Randy was also considered an enemy later in life. They were, you know, he and Arneson were, were pals, but you know, it's just childish stuff between 20 somethings. getting oh, fights God, I, I would all, stuff. It was it, the, the disputes that would happen when you were in your twenties be like, uh, honest to God, 
over a sleeping bag that got thrown out because it yeah, was, it was moldy, and but it was mine. You can right, throw exactly, and it's like, How can you throw my thing away? Yeah, um, yeah, and then you know, and then, you know, goes on for like ten years. No, it it really is that that era. By the way, um, uh, Emperor's Choice, I believe this is going to be George. Uh, they'll be at Ga at Gary Con at the uh, Goodman Games uh, Black Blade Publishing booth. It's, so, uh, it's George. Yeah. Oh, George yeah. I mean, if there's still a slot open for the Fletcher Pratt game, come play. If you get a chance to break away for that, or if you want to break away and try to sneak in on the, you know, they always give you like limited slots and stuff, but I'll squeeze people in. Like I was supposed to, I, I was supposed to only have 12 players in Tonisborg, and I saw that two people were on the waiting list. So I have to ask the convention to just open it up to 14 players. So I, I could add two more. Yeah. Um, and then, like the year before, I had maybe eight people, four people didn't show up to the session in 2019. And so I said, well, yeah, you know, you know, go out in the hall, grab somebody. Or if you got a friend, call them, tell them to come play. And so we ended up, I think, I think we had 12, 12 players by the time we started, but most of them weren't registered for the game. Oh, um, you're, you're like me at a convention. It's like, because, it again, if you want to play... I, yeah, you, you, you know the slots, eight slots. And listen, I, I stand when I when I GM. I don't sit down. I need to at a convention. I need to project. I need to get in your face. I can't do that sitting behind a screen. Right, I, need, I don't use a screen. I use a clipboard. But I, I just need a corner of the table somewhere where I can roll dice when necessary. And I make my players roll the dice for me actually now. Oh, that's actually probably a better idea. To come to think of it, it's great because when you you ask them for die rolls and don't tell them what what it's for. Like, oh. what'd you get? Okay. <laughs> oh, he hit you. What? But when they're going down hallways and it's like, can you roll me a D6? You know? And oh. It's just that the paranoia roll, you know? It's like oh, no, yeah, that, that, that's good. because Building the tension. I, 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 I never like turning people away who are interested in, in playing in a game that I'm running because you're at a convention, you're there to have fun. Yeah. And if I'm running a game, I'm there to facilitate enjoyment. Yeah, I, I can handle mm -hmm. up to 12 players. Beyond that, it gets a little flaky for me. But, uh, you know, eight eight is easy. You know, that's, that's a ground ball. I can do – I usually do uh, uh, about – eight is about my average. Yeah. Each running two characters. That way oh, I can really – like in OD and D, you know, if you let them run two characters, you can really just tear into because the, the rules are the way the rules are set up. It's just carnage. Like, yeah, I remember looking at D and D when I first bought my first set. I was like, looking at that at the number probabilities because I'm a nerd, right? Of of the to hit and then also, but I was like, okay, so you're not getting hit a lot, but when you get hit, you've got that one to eight for a sword that can yeah. just take you out, mm -hmm. you know, and um, um, yeah, so. I mean, that's kind of my whole thing is just like, you know, just especially when you get older, it's like, I don't I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it here next week. So let's just tear it up this week and kill yeah. a bunch of PCs and you just roll up a new one. It's just a piece of paper, you know, the whole investment in my backstory and all that. It's like, oh, man. Your backstory isn't established until about three sessions <laughs> in anyway. I'm sorry. Yeah. You earn your backstory, right? Right. Yeah. It, is, yeah. it, it isn't like, oh, well, my character. Decided. No, no. The conqueror of the eastern waste and yeah, the, no, yeah. no, no, no. But your first yeah. level, but your first level. What do you yeah. what do you mean? Yeah, yeah. You, you gotta survive a little bit and then we'll figure out your backstory. It'll evolve. It will evolve. Yeah. So anyway, I should probably run along. I just wanted to ask if anybody had any quick questions, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've been going for I got a little timer. We do Two and a half hours. I jokingly yeah. said we'd go through. I mean, I could go another half an hour. Uh, my, my, I don't know my, if my bladder it. wouldn't survive. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can go pee. I'll just talk. Um, or you got just finish that glass and you know. Oh no, I'd overflow it if I did that. Okay. But um, uh, no, this this is. I mean, Griff, just honestly, you're welcome back whenever you want to come back. Okay. You know? Yeah. No, I'm just glad. You know, you said you rewatched the movie and you like felt like you liked it even more the second. I time. I did because I caught more the second time. Yeah. You know, a... the first time I I I watched it, I was watching it because. It's a documentary about D and D. And the second time I rewatched it, I was like, "All right, so I know the basics, but now I'm listening for stuff that I didn't catch the first time." Now, you know, the first time I went into it, and it's kind of like, you know, you're there for the ride. 
right. the time I've done the ride. Now I want to actually see the scenery and recognize stuff that maybe I didn't see before because I was too involved in the actual ride. Now I can appreciate some other stuff. And again, that was, I, yeah. It, that, yeah. Well, that was like a, you know, a lot of people complain because they feel like it's not about everything about D and D, but um, it's there's so much to go into with the movie. Like, like if we had gone into all the stuff about TSR, you'd miss all the stuff that was all the detail that was in there about the 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 origins of the role playing format, you know, the right. style. And uh, like we were watching this documentary when I was, I got together with Chris because we got to put together all these games that we got these old games, and we're like at a table walking around putting, you know, a sheet, a sheet, a sheet. And then we sat and watched a uh, part of Muscle Shoals, the rock and roll documentary. I don't oh, know if I you've seen, seen that. that one. Oh. Great documentary, but his complaint, and it was a valid complaint, was that the beginning of the, the movie, early on, he, the, the main guy who starts the recording studio meets this, this uh, African-American guy that's a bellhop at a local hotel. And the bellhop plays him a song, and the guy's like, that's, that's a hit. We're going to record it. And the guy's like, when are we going to cut it? And he's like, we're going to, this, you know, tomorrow, we're going to cut it tomorrow. And so they record this, this song. And then it jumps from that point to an interview with uh, uh, not Mick Jagger, but the guitar player, Keith Richards, talking about how they had heard this song and they were just amazed by this, this is music coming out of Muscle Shoals. And they're just like, wow. And so they recorded their version of that song. And so, but that was like, how did, you know, you're in a, tiny town in Tennessee, how did you get, you know, you cut these records in your own studio. Like, what did you, what do you cut? Like, what do you cut a record on? You know, like, right. you know, like, what does that mean to cut a record? And then, and then you take these records and, and who do you give them to so that they get out? Like, how does a record that's been cut as a 45 in Muscle Shoals, I think it's Tennessee, end up in London with Keith Richards in his collection of 45 you know what i mean it's like so they just skipped that whole gap and so that was and kind of one of the gap things is the part that becomes see, that's the story right that, yes that's the story because that and maybe it's because i was a history major and i always like to understand not just the events that happened why what led up to the battle of hastings what were what were the motivations no, I, I don't care about the battle itself that's the history that everybody talks usually about. the battle is one it's all the stuff you're talking about it's like you know they like especially have you ever read much about um stonewall jackson some yes i mean the guy's just the guy was a genius he was always working to make his troops you know march ridiculous distances and then and then he'd be out flanking the enemy and the enemy didn't even know he was already there because they thought like he's a day's march away he can't be here but he was just like, yeah, we're going to march 20 hours today. And then come dawn, we're going to be training our cannons on the enemy and they're going to freak out and run away, you know. And um, that, yeah, that's kind of like the whole thing with the uh, um, the movie is like that. The, the stuff that happens, like the minute Dungeons and Dragons is published, that is, you know, that's not real. That's the story of some other stuff. I don't know. Right. The TSR Company or Gary Gygax. Arneson isn't there after 76. So you can't tell Arneson's story after 76. You know, it's all about Gary Gygax after that. Um, um, and that's, you know, most people know that story. It's already out there. People have talked about it endlessly. Right. You don't need to, you don't need to rehash it. You need to cover the story that many of us, most of us haven't seen. Yeah. Or haven't heard or have only heard, uh, the one side and didn't get to see it from Dave's perspective, right? Which, which I think was was, but you but you're not seeing it through Dave's eyes. You're seeing it through the eyes of the people that were part of Dave's circle, which is another way to see it. Which is interesting because you get different perspectives on the events. It just, folks, if you haven't seen it yet, um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to say it again, please. Secrets of Blackmore.com. Go see the movie. Um, if you have to watch it on Amazon Prime, God bless you, whatever. But just really, you should see it. It's really, really well done. And uh, even if you are somebody who generally doesn't like documentaries, 
you'll get lost in it because it's it's something that we're we're passionate about. If you're watching this shit, you're passionate about yeah, stuff yeah. That, that that Griff put out there. And it might make you curious about wargaming too. Like I, uh, I think that, like especially like it's funny to me because Pathfinder, for instance, the way the combats work, it takes hours to play a combat in Pathfinder. Yeah, it's it's, it's a it's a war game. Yeah. If you're playing a war fantasy war game, you know, and they they think it's still fantasy role playing. It's like no, you're just rolling dice and moving. That's a war game. You're playing a fantasy, and I'm not saying it's bad or good, but. If you can do that, you could probably play a Napoleonic's war game or something like yeah, that. We'll, we'll, we'll break out squad leader for you. Have you have 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 your good time. Yeah. So this thing. Thomasburg. Yeah, the Lost Dungeons of Thomas Borg. I don't know if you can see that very well. Uh, it's kind of yeah, there, sort of like that. A little bit, yeah. By Boop. that way, Greg Svensson. Um, this is available now. Pre-orders. Um, we're going to try to ship the books for the pre-orders before we finish the Kickstarter. It depends on, you know, the logistics of the printing. We've been having a lot of trouble with printing, um, a lot of delays with that. And um, um, what else? That's it. And then we're going to try to do more games. We have a, a whole collection of, like, we have a Dave Arneson gangster game that he did, uh, an RPG for 1930s gangster stuff. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah, and that's the... That's the thing where like Gary and Dave would always uh, <clears throat> make reference to each other in games they produced. Like, like the teeth of Dalren is, is I think uh, one of the magic items in in, in AD and D. It's mm -hmm. a reference to Arneson. Dal, Dal, it's like Dave Arneson. You know, it, it's a, an anagram. And uh, like uh, the 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 uh, the uh, gangster game takes place in a place called Zurich, Wisconsin. Which looks an awful lot like Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Nice. And there's a Lake Zurich uh, and a town, Lake Zurich, Wisconsin, which is you know him poking oh, yeah. at Gary and company. Um, but we have that. We have uh, I don't know if I've told you about this in our in our chats, but we have we have a draft of what would have been probably the first sci-fi space adventure game, which was called uh, Star Master by John Snyder. We have a draft of that. Oh. We have a couple drafts, and I I think I might have found somebody who has yet another draft and so we're going to try to publish that um we have uh john uh we also are trying to get the rights to publish a mutant which would have been the first it would have it there is a lot of conjecture that there is a certain tsr game or set of games that have mutants in them that is basically plagiarized from this other game called mutant that was never published by tsr i'll just Ooh. say that Okay. Um, and uh, yeah. but we have access to a draft of that, and I've been talking to this to uh, Richard and John's family, to the whole family about that, and they're way behind it. Um, and then uh, what else? David McGarry has made a dungeon that he wants to publish. We've got a war game, Kriegzug, by two of the Belfry brothers, who were mostly played dwarves, I think, in Blackmoor, and they have their own uh, Seven Years' War combat system, which they said, like, yeah, Dave was the one who told us we had to include. The fog of war so there are rules for the fog of war which is what role playing comes from right in this game so it's a good and what we'd like to do is is publish that game and then have an appendix and a, and publish the original david wesley um strategos n rules and then there are all the the strategos n or the strategos variants that they played in the twin cities strategos a for ancients c for civil war and rt for russo turkish war and so publish that as like the appendix to Kriegzug to sort of have this this volume that is like the the lineage of games that that led up to the creation of role playing games through war gaming. Um, um, and then what else? Yeah, we just got a lot of like a lot of game. You know, we're a small company. It takes us a long time to to develop stuff, but um, we're trying to come up with a lot of like really old stuff that was never published that is just sitting in draft form somewhere. That's awesome. Man. That 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 is the stuff of, of gaming gold, really. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I I've got um, when we were with John, he had he had kept a draft of Star Master, which is the third episode of like Star Probe, Star Empire, Star Master. Okay. Um, which TSR was supposed to publish, and they had their little schism with Dave, and they wouldn't publish stuff by Twin Cities designers anymore, so they didn't publish that. Um, they did Star Frontier, which somebody noted that it actually has certain mechanical properties that are really similar to Star Mask, to uh, Star Probe and Star Empire, and they think that 
they took stuff from Star Master and put it in some okay. stuff. Yeah, I mean, TSR, uh, I'm not saying Gary, but the people working with Gary, there were some weasels in there. Um, <clears throat> and they were doing some like unsavory things. But John had what remained of his set of rules because he had a flood in his basement and lost most of his gaming collection. He gave me a gigantic gaming collection and he had lost most of it in a flood. And um, But he um, gave me like a thing like this, which is his Space Monster Manual, mm -hmm. which is interesting because Traveler never had any... Like it, oh. Traveler was weird because it didn't have space critters. You yeah, know, it was all about humans in space, but no space critters. And so uh, I have that draft and, and we're going to put it together with this other draft that David McGarry had. And then I also have a couple pages of like his handgun rules, which I haven't had the time to really examine it and compare it to like, say, uh, one of the TSR mutant T games. But um, um, I'll be curious to see if that maybe there is some sort of connection there that TSR was basically copying some of the unpublished games and publishing them under other names. Uh, be very interesting to see. Yeah, that was. I mean, I, and you know, people are going to be like, "You're a bad person for saying that." And it's like, I am just observing the stuff. Right. You know? I, I I didn't do it. It happened 50 years ago. I don't. I don't really care aside from from a historical perspective. Like, what was going on there? That's kind of interesting. You know, were they yeah. plagiarizing stuff? Like, and also there was a, a a culture of lifting. They called it lifting. You know, like. You buy a game and you like the combat system, but you don't like the movement system. You lift mm -hmm. the combat system and put it in your home system, right? But they weren't publishing, but then they transitioned to publishing and they were very loose on what they thought the copyright rules were. Yeah. So like Chainmail, I think John Peterson did that whole write-up on Chainmail and was like, yeah, Chainmail is just lifted directly from uh, Leonard Pat's fantasy rules. Gary didn't invent that. He took it, you know? Um, so yeah, anyway, I don't know. Is there anything else to say? No, I think we covered it. Somebody just got here. And is yeah, like, are, are we, we really live? Yes, Jamie, we are live. You're gonna have to watch, you're gonna have to watch the replay. Don't worry, it's only about two hours and 40 minutes. Yeah, we aim All to right. please, <clears throat> but please aim. I um, could go on and on, but I don't want to bore you. But we, we should, uh, we'll talk again, you yeah, know, definitely. We'll have you back. Yeah, this is, um, this is a good time. Uh, by the way, Mike, um, Mike's at Whataburger with his uh, grandson. This thing will last forever, though. It's it like hardbound. It's a well-made book. It's it's if you're in the into like original Dungeons and Dragons or even AD and D, you can use it with AD and D or AD &D. Hear that cover? Oh, my yeah, name. you hear that? Yeah. That's it's it's a, it's a great book. You won't you won't be disappointed. Secretsofblackmore.com. Uh, huge thanks to Griff. Uh, thanks to Mike. My Tell friend. your friends about the movie. Like, we really need to get people renting the movie, and we're just a small company. I mean, it's just me and Chris. It's not, we're not a big film company. Tell your friend. If you got any friends in your game group, just have you seen Secrets of Blackmore? Check it out, you know? Yeah. I, I, again, secretsofblackmore.com. It's up on the screen, so you can't miss it. Um, we'll have Griff back because it was a great time with him. Yeah. Uh, I, the usuals, all right? Listen, we're still in the midst of the world of the pandemic. Uh, you're either an adult if you're watching this or you're uh, living with adults that are your guardians or parents. Um, be guided by such or use your common sense if you are an adult. That's all. I'm not saying wear a mask or get vaxxed. At this point, common sense. That's all I'm asking of you. Uh, be safe. Be well. God bless. Roll those dice. Roll them well. Uh, God willing, I'll be back again tomorrow. Live stream 8 p.m. with uh, Glenn Halstrom on Friday. Rach and I will be here Saturday night, 8 p.m. with Gamers Health. And otherwise, again, huge thanks to our live audience. It sounds weird saying that. It's like it's like Saturday Night Live. You're live, oh, yeah. A live audience in New York and, and other states. But, hey, again, folks, thank you much. We're out of here. <laughs>